The unyielding determination helped the fighters to overcome difficulties, which we had a lot of in this campaign, in all our struggle. People have developed a very definite view on this matter, a kind of philosophy which served as a kind of armour against bad thoughts, decadent moods that arise in difficult moments. As we approached Rila, we first of all thought about how to establish contact with the Duplanet's detachment. We knew that Zeljo Demiriski had returned from Trinska Okolia, but since at Ogorelika we had to part unexpectedly and had no time to agree on the place and time of the meeting, we had to rely on a lucky chance. Jello was familiar with our plans, and we hoped that he would wait for us here and find us. From dawn till two o'clock in the afternoon, the brigade climbed up the mountain steeps, and during all this time we hardly covered a few kilometres. And how could we move faster if the soldiers were extremely tired and hungry? Where to get food? This question was a primary concern to the brigade command. I involuntarily remembered a tale about how some distant country was in a desperate situation, where the bread supply had come to an end and there was not a grain left even for sowing. Death threatened the whole parody. Now we, the five leaders, were sitting like wise men from that fairy tale, agonizing over where to get. Different opinions were expressed. Some said that we should send a group of fighters to the village of German. Others thought that we should scout here in the mountains. Was there not a single herd or cheese factory left in Rila? Both of those suggestions were acceptable. So there's no point in waiting for something else. Especially since a few men have disappeared and there's every reason to fear the enemy may be on our trail. We selected a group of two dozen strong fighters to send to German. Dimitar Pachelinski was appointed commander and Georgi Nastiv was appointed political commissar. I gave them instructions, the password and the place of the meeting. They had one task, to bring as much food as possible. The other group included the intendant Tador Strigachev and three more fighters. Both groups lived, having planted hope in our souls. Now it was possible to give room for imagination, to imagine that in your hands you had a big slice of bread and a piece of brinza, and you were eating it all with appetite, drinking cold Rila water. And why not imagine an even greater luxury? A roasted lamb or a good slice of excellent Rila cheese, glistening with drops of oil? One could, of course, but people had no energy left even to dream. They fell into sleep. It was now the sweetest of all treats to them. Some thought that after such a tiring trek, one could even sleep for three days in a row. Well, very possibly. Fatigue and exhaustion put their grim imprint on the faces of the soldiers and commanders, on their gait and in general on all their behaviour. Sleep had taken its toll on the men. And the effect of its charms was aggravated by the aroma of herbs filled with morning dew, the resinous spirit of the pine forest which the breeze carried to us in waves. Usually we used our breaks not only for rest, but also for political work. It took time to fill the gaps in the consciousness of the fighters. That's what we always did, and that's what we did now. We involved the entire party political apparatus, from the brigade commissar to political delegates in the branches. We received a lot of signals about the bad mood of some of the fighters, caused by the difficulties of the campaign, the most serious of them, the unauthorised departure of several people who apparently did not find the strength to endure to the end. This prompted us to gather battalion commanders and commissars. Bolgarinov spoke. A distinctive feature of his character was firmness, conviction in what he was explaining. Bolgarinov understood that in such difficult moments, the slightest hesitation or softness of the commander can turn into major disasters, so he considered inadmissible in the behaviour of the command staff even a hint of helplessness or hopelessness. Regarding the upcoming victory and favourable outcome of the fight, he spoke with such confidence, as if a hundred times in practice checked its course and outcome. Bolgarinov's words not only encouraged people, but also gave them a charge of faith for a long period. Besides, the example of Bolgarinov himself was in front of their eyes. He suffered from a hernia, but no one heard a single complaint or a single groan from him. This had its educational effect on us, his closest assistants. At the end of the conversation, the commander of the zone warned that even greater difficulties were not excluded and demanded from the command staff full mobilization of forces and collectedness. Until evening, everyone slept. Only duty officers and combat guards were awake. When it got colder, it became much colder. I ordered to wake up the fighters. We had to move to a more sheltered place where we could make fires. We found such a place in the area of Wolf Stone in Bogdan Tract, 
We immediately built fires there. There was a lot of excitement around them. Sleep had cheered up the soldiers, and now some of them told their comrades different funny stories, others sang, and others dreamed of the times that would come after the victory. Just then, a group of Strigachev's men appeared on the path running down to the camp. The men were driving three sheep, dragging a large copper cauldron. This raised the mood of the fighters, and voices were heard saying that dreams sometimes come true. Well, now we'll chop, shouted long-legged Nimitatosev. We'll save a mutton after this cavalry gallop. You, long one, will not have enough sheep alone. Peter Malinov taunted him. Well, you're not a little one either, Victor interrupted him ironically. You'll probably grind a sheep yourself. Mr. Dimitar Grybchev, the commissar of the second battalion, approached them. He looked at them through the convex glasses and said, Instead of arguing about who will eat more, go and get some wood. Go go. Oh, what a hard man this Sokolov is. He won't even let me joke. You, said Madinov, say such jokes, which only tantalize people's appetite, are inappropriate here, Sokolov concluded philosophically. In fact, no one expected an order for firewood. While some men were gathering them, a few fighters were busy with the sheep, stabbing them, skinning them, cutting up the carcasses. A cauldron full of meat hung over the fire. The merriment around was even more intense. Everyone's tongues were loose. Even such silent men as Velko, Byzacarius, Stocho and Stanka began to talk. Only her brother Ivan still kept silent, as if he expected a higher price for him. You should have said something, Ivan, Victor said to him. Or can't you forget your father's cows? Come on, don't think about it. What's the use of them, those thoughts? I felt sorry for my grandfather's cows too, but I overcame myself and so should... Ivan answered nothing, only sighed and scratched his nose. His sister answered for him. If he had been sorry for the cows, he wouldn't be sitting here. Well, how can I put it? I felt sorry not only for the cows, but also for the chickens, and yet I went into the forest. It all depends on who persuaded you and how. Time passes quickly when we talk. And they didn't notice how the water boiled and the meat was boiled. Then they put the second portion into the cauldron and cooked all the meat till morning. Of course, it could not satiate everyone, but the acute hunger was... Apparently, he was preparing, attacking the height, to bypass it from the south and cut off our escape routes. Machine gunners in full readiness. I was waiting for the right moment. Hmm, what's going on? Asked Stoshato neighbor machine gunner. How long will we wait? The commander hardens our will, answered Bonev. So a little more, and they will grab the barrel of my machine gun. Let's ask permission to shoot, suggested Stoiko. The commander knows best. He probably has his own plan, said Bonev. But then the command sounded and dozens of machine guns Rifles and machine guns simultaneously struck from the rocks. The enemy chains jumbled together. Some of the soldiers rushed into the nearest lowland. Others ran back without firing a single shot. About a dozen corpses were left on the spot. The attackers pulled back to their original positions and began firing mortars at us. In the afternoon, at about four o'clock, I received an order from the zone commander to secretly withdraw the battalion from the occupied position and moved to the place where, after the successful attack on Granitoid, the Dupnitsky detachment and our two battalions had settled down. Everything went well with the power station. Ours met no resistance there. On the contrary, when the workers there saw the partisans, they opened the warehouse with food and equipment, and almost everything that was. Corned beef, brinza, sugar, rubber shoes, and much more distributed to the partisans. One of the workers expressed his desire to become a partisan and made a passionate speech to his comrades. There was enough food for everyone in the camp. The comrades had already had lunch, and we were also waiting for lunch. After the meeting with the Dupnitsky detachment, the prospects of our supply became real. The detachment had established strong ties with the locals, and several secret warehouses had been set up in the mountains in case of emergencies. After a long, difficult trek, several partisans fell ill. They could not go further with the brigade. Therefore, the command decided to allocate them, 15 people, in a special group. Liaisons from the Dupnitsky detachment would help them to get to their districts, where they would receive the necessary assistance from the local party organizations. In this group, we included Gosho and his parents. It was touching to say goodbye to him. He did not want to leave. He was very worried, but circumstances demanded it. 
At daylight, the brigade and the Dupnitsky detachment left the area of Granitoid and moved to the southwest, intending to cross the Rila River there. It took us two whole days in the mountains to get to the river. May was already at an end, and here we were blocked by deep snow drifts covered with crusted ice, fallen trees, pits and landslides, sharp rocks and steeps, turbulent streams and many other things. Only the third dawn caught the hour on the right bank of the river. All this time we had nowhere to replenish our provisions. All we had left was an enzy, a single hypha that we were carrying with us. We had to slaughter her. Many fighters did not wait for the food to be cooked. They ate their portions half raw. Early our Belcho did not know hunger. There he would snack on leaves or grass, there he would grab some oats or barley from a roadside field. But he never lagged behind the column. He had to overcome many obstacles. But the radio, loaded on his back, remained intact. He lay down only when we freed him from the packs. Belcho behaved like a disciplined fighter who would not do anything that could harm the cause. That's why he was respected by all the guerrillas. The Rila River is full and turbulent. In this area, it is the largest of all the rivers. Its bottom is covered with many small and large stones. The fast current has smoothed and rounded them so much that it is impossible to stay on them. We tried to wade across, but only a man reached the middle as the current picked him up and knocked him down. This option had to be abandoned, but not the crossing at all. We needed to go to the other side, Firstly, because our route demanded it, and secondly, it was not excluded that the enemy would block us. Not far from the place where we reached the river, a bridge of the narrow gauge railway, which is laid from the Rilla Monastery to the station Kocherinovo on the Sofia Kula Railroad, is crossed over it. A highway ran parallel to the narrow gauge railway, along the right bank of the river. In the area of the bridge, it was a few meters higher than it. Having decided to cross the bridge, we allowed the possibility that the enemy was waiting for us there. But still, even though with a fight, but we should break through. Just in case, of course, we should have sent a scout. We selected a few brave men from the Dupnitsa detachment. Among them were Boyko from the village of Padala and Blagoy from Pastra. They stealthily approached the bridge and found that it was guarded by soldiers. But how many soldiers there were, they didn't know. It was impossible to delay because after dawn reinforcements could come to them. The situation demanded quick and sudden action. Every lost minute turned out to be to our detriment. Fifteen machine gunners and machine gunners were allocated to the strike group. Gello himself went with them. He knew the whole area like the back of his hand. In addition, Chapayev's courage did not let him sit in one place. The group should have approached the bridge unnoticed, fire on the guards and turn it into flight. Following the group moved and the column, the fighters went quickly at shortened intervals. The brigade command, which was usually located in the middle of the column, this time moved to its head so that it could make timely decisions. Already on the approach to the bridge, Gello's group opened fire. The enemy was taken by surprise, and under cover of their comrades' fire, a few guerrillas managed to slip over the bridge into a narrow dead zone on the other bank, which immediately from the water forms a high slope overgrown with thick beaches. Under these trees, an enemy unit had been entrenched and camouflaged since the evening. They intended to intercept us on the march and surround us before we crossed the river. If we succeeded in crossing, we could escape through dense woods. Taking advantage of the fact that their trenches were much higher than the bridge and the highway, the soldiers fired on the column with machine guns and machine guns and threw several grenades on the bridge. At this time, the head of the column was already on the line of the bridge. In order not to expose themselves to bullets, the soldiers on their own initiative lay down in a roadside ditch. Literally in an instant the brigade was hidden in it. The enemy was shelling a large section of the highway. Hundreds of bullets hit the rocks, ricocheted, whistled over our heads. The avalanche of fire was growing. If we continued to linger on the highway, the position of the brigade could become simply hopeless. But instinct overpowered reason. And, instead of moving across the bridge, the Ludus huddled even tighter to the ground. Trying to lift the men from the ditch, I made my way along the column. But no one ventured to take the first step. Here I saw Aunt Tiveta. She knew nothing about the fate of her children. She wanted to ask me about them. The questions were ready to roll off her tongue, written all over her face, but realising how anxious I was, she did not dare to speak. Throwing her a few encouraging words, I ducked down and walked along the ditch, where hundreds of eyes were looking questioningly at me. At times like this, personal example means a lot. 
it was important that one of the partisans still rose up and dragged the whole brigade to the bridge. However, this did not happen. People thought it was madness to get under the bullets and kept their heads down. It was simply impossible to lose any more time. At a distant bend in the highway, three trucks with policemen appeared. If we delayed even a little longer, our crossing might break down and then few people would be able to escape. The only way out I saw was to get across the river as quickly as possible, to fire on the Polizi who were rushing to the bridge, and to get away down the slope covered with dense forest, where we would be almost out of reach of the bullets. When reinforcements arrived to the enemy, we were already on the opposite bank and were climbing to Sarev's peak. The column was missing Bonev, Milka, Pervan, Stoyan Durov, Pavel, Svailika, my fellow villager Gulena, Ant Seta, Iptie, Peter Asinov, Isaac Talvi, and several others whose names I did not know. Some of them were killed, others were wounded, and others simply did not make it across the bridge in time and were captured. In the column they were talking about the death of Inchi, a partisan from the village of Ryla in the Dupmika district. He died with the Marseillaise on his lips. Peter Asinov, Stoyan Dura from Trine region, Isaac Talvi from Sofia and several other men from the Dupnitsa detachment laid down their heads on the bridge near Inja. By Zakarius, Boyka, Intendant Strigachev, and others were wounded. The enemies seized Aunt Tetsase. Courageously, she held on at the police headquarters in Dupnika, where she was taken. The enraged executioners took her to Ryla and shot her. After September 9, 1944, we found only scraps of her clothes among the rocks. Crossing the bridge became one of the biggest tests for the soldiers and commanders of the brigade, only people who fight for a great and holy cause. For what concerns the whole nation can overcome a strictly limited area, which is fired from all sides from automatic weapons, where grenades explode, scattering around dozens of death carrying shrapnel. Only those who deeply realize that without sacrifice, this great goal cannot be achieved. During this heroic crossing, Belcho, our favorite horse, also performed a feat. When the fighters had already passed the bridge, he was still on the other bank. Belcho looked around, listened, and having heard the voice of Stefan Vasilev, who had accompanied him all the way and was now calling loudly from the opposite side, rushed to the call, trying not to slip. As if realizing the value of the cargo entrusted to him, he swung across the bridge in a few jumps. When he came close to us, he snorted happily, arched his neck and rubbed his head against Stefan's shoulder, whom he apparently regarded as his master. Many of us have heard of Sars Peak. It is as high as the famous Yumukchel, but its 2376 meters do not look so impressive at close range. The spurs that surround the peak on all sides are misleading to those who climb it for the first time. It seems that the summit is very close. But when you climb up one of these cones, a new one opens behind it. When you overcome it, another one is waiting there. And it repeats several times. You will spend a lot of time until you reach the top. You will have to make a lot of stops. This ascent was hard for us, and yet we felt more confident when we were moving upwards than when we had to go down into the valleys. They constrained us put us in disadvantageous conditions, concealed innumerable dangers, and at the same time it was difficult to find food in the mountains. The summit was empty now, nothing alive. No birds were flying, not even the chirping of grasshoppers could be heard. The snow had just melted here. Shapeless patches of it were still white in holes and crevices. Dense coniferous forests were rising all around. And in the south, on the green plain, like blossoming trees in an orchard, Dozens of distant villages were barely visible through the summer gloom. While the brigade stretched out in a long line over the ascent, I sent some partisans out for a foot of edibles. Imrivas had become very unpretentious about food. We were ready to eat horse meat, dog meat, and meat of meat of any other animal, which until we became partisans, we would not have even looked at. Except for the heifer, which we kept as a reserve and from which we each got a piece of fifty grams. We ate nothing else from Granitoid to Taravea Peak. That's why we climbed it at a snail's pace. That's why I gave a very categorical instruction to the troop I had sent. Do not show yourselves to us without food. We knew that at this time of year no herds were to be seen in Ryla, and yet we all had hope in our hearts. No one is ordered to hope. Even those who have nothing to hope for. I wish we were not one of them. After two partisan units met at the top of Polisha, we first of all decided to take into account the available personnel and reorganize. The thing is that in cheetahs and battalions there were not enough people. One battalion lacked even a whole couple. 
It was commanded by Laser Wasef from the village of Dikan from Radomir district, and the whole battalion consisted of Radomir fighters. They are great patriots of their region, and so they were all looking for ways to return to their native Okolia. This local patriotism of theirs played out the more strongly, the more hardships fell to our share in the current difficult and long march. It was aggravated, in their opinion, by the distance from the goal we had to reach. They preferred to remain in their native land, and immediately took advantage of the situation. Of course, the brigade commanders and the men themselves could not but condemn them for this. Now that we had such a successful meeting with the Dupnitsky detachment, we should not, in our opinion, have been separated any longer. The Dupnikins knew well the local places and conditions, and could help us to establish faster communication with the Gorodshumayans and Razlogchans. For the sake of which, in fact, we had made this difficult journey, suffered so many hardships and lost our com- The zone commander tried to convince Zhilo Demirevsky of the expediency of joint actions, but he resisted and stood firmly on his own. Here, in the mountain caves, the Dupnikans laid secret food stores. Here it is easier for them to hold out. After all, a small in number detachment cannot compare with a unit such as a brigade, or even two. Apparently, all this prompted the detachment leadership to isolate themselves from us at any cost, putting only a group of guides at our disposal. This circumstance created a number of additional difficulties that affected the further actions of the brigade. It was not enough that we had suffered hardships, battles and hunger, but here on Sarevaya MIT, we were confronted with manifestations of anarchist sentiments. During the reorganization of the brigade, Ferdinand Pudev and Dimitar Toshev wished to be in the same battalion. Obviously, during the campaign, they felt the kinship of their souls, far from being alien to anarchism. Soon or later, this couple was going to surprise us. You can't hide a thing in a bag. Ferdinand Pudev was one of those soldiers who had once been taken prisoner by the Yugoslav partisans and then handed over to our unit. Since he wished to stay with us, emphasized that he grew up in a progressive-minded family, we believed him, accepted him into the party, appointed him commander of the four, and later, when the first brigade went on campaign, took him with us and put him in command of the battalion. Of course, we had little time to carefully analyze his behavior, and this forced us now to look more closely at him, not to miss the slightest manifestations of his nature. And he showed himself. It happened on the approach to the Rilla River, seeing a piece of bread and a little sugar in the satchel of the brigade commissar, saved by him for those who were sick or especially exhausted. Pudev started a quarrel, tried to restore the soldiers against the brigade leadership. We regarded this misdemeanor as a direct consequence of his indiscipline and anarchist views, but decided not to resort to extreme measures, since the brigade was entering an area that Pudev knew well and thus could be useful to us. Only this circumstance saved him from being shot. After we finished the reorganization and said goodbye to the Dupnitsky partisans and the wounded and sick who had gone with them, we, the brigade commanders, sat down in a corner to map out the future route. The main advisor was a Dupnitsa partisan, Moise Avramov, who claimed to be well acquainted with the local mountains. He had travelled up and down Rila with a tourist backpack and knew many of the sites and almost all the local campgrounds. Just when we finished this work, we heard someone shouting joyfully, Hey, comrades, get up, get up quickly. What happened? asked Ninko. Mmm, food, comrades, food. Look over there on the ridge. The group is returning. Indeed, the group we sent was returning, four oxen and three horses in front of them. Brigade, rise. Bogaranov commanded. We have to get out of here. Enemy planes will hang over our heads. I ordered that the battalions lined up according to the newly established order, sent forward marching guard. We moved in a southeastern direction. The sun had set. At the horizon, on the eastern side, the edge of the lunar disk peeked through. It grew larger and larger. The light of the moon spilled over the star's speckled sky. We walked for about an hour. The trail wound among clusters of rocks and stones through thickets of ferns. Finally, we came to a secluded clearing. It was crossed by a rivulet. It twisted noiselessly among the thickets, so that lower down the slope it suddenly rushed down the steep slope with a roar. A lonely moon stood above us, looking into the running waters. This is where we will stop, said Moise Avramov. The brigade began to settle down for rest, and the men, who had been assigned to the butchers, quickly got down to business. 
I allocated one ox for each battalion, and the fourth one was left as a reserve. Soldiers and commanders, without waiting for special instructions, began to collect dead wood built for ox. The work was going on. No one was sitting idle. Some of them trimmed twigs for skewers, others sharpened their knives on stones, and when the oxen were slaughtered, the soldiers crowded near them, and without waiting for them to be completely refreshed, cut off pieces of meat to roast on the fire. Then he did not have the patience to wait for the meat to roast. They fried it only from the top and began to tear it with their teeth, sometimes without even chewing it. In our literature, both in prose and poetry, many lines are dedicated to Rila, many readers admired the marvellous beauty described by its enthusiastic admirers, but at that moment we were deeply disappointed and saddened by the inhospitable nature of these mountains, riotous and cold streams and rivulets, cliffs and rocks, countless peaks. Of course, the mountains have not lost their beauty, which touched the poet's soul. But after all, the perception of beauty, all our feelings and pleasures, no matter how prosaic it sounds, are connected with the material life of man. Hungry and exhausted, he is unable to see and feel this beauty. His thoughts are directed to other things, and he has a completely different idea of beauty. Perhaps it comes to mind. Those who wrote these inspired poems, these beautiful stories about the proud and rugged mountains, had bread, sausage, and a bottle of good wine in their knapsacks. The relativity of such descriptions was quite obvious to us. In the 3rd Battalion, which had encamped near the forest itself, a furious bickering suddenly broke out. How did you miss him, you fool? Where were your eyes? Now your comrades will have to starve because of you, shouted Ferdinand Pudev at the top of his voice. He ran away, comrade commander. A man's voice answered tearfully. He ran away. Why didn't you hold him well? You're a big, big fellow, aren't you? I held him, and he broke free and ran away. Hmm, said the guilty partisan. The case did not require special verification. It was clear from the conversation that the reserve ox had run away. Only later it turned out that he had not run away. He had been slaughtered by Pudev's men, and the latter had staged an altercation to hide the ends in water. Time would pass, fatigue and difficulties would be forgotten. Only dear memories of those heroic days will remain, and everyone will remember with gratitude and love the combat comrades who were ready to share the last piece of bread, will warmly remember those who showed themselves true communists, and about those who tried to ride on someone else's hump, created additional difficulties, aggravating the hardships which already, not sparingly, prepared for us by the enemy and harsh nature. About such we'll only say with sorrow. What place is there for such a one in the ranks of the fighters? Huddled around the fires, the partisans were talking to each other. Velko, Stanko and Simo were proving that it was they who had ensured the success of the crossing for the brigade, arguing among themselves about who had shot more cartridges. We must admit, friends, we say Samo in conclusion, that hinge was the best shot. His machine gun first constrained the enemy, for a long time did not let him raise his head. Yes, everyone should take off their hats in front of Inge the machine gunner, Yeah, said Stanko, scratching his head. He turned his meat rod over the fire, looked into the faces of his comrades lit up by the fire, and continued. I wish I knew what had become of him. If he is alive, we will surely meet again. If he died, eternal glory to him. The rest of the guerrillas sighed and sorrowed silence reigned. At another campfire, Stocho from Bresniki Okolia started a conversation. He told about the battle at Maley Polich Hill, when his machine gun, perfectly camouflaged among the rocks, participated in the repulsion of the enemy attack. As soon as I started firing, Stocho said with some bravado, they began to fall like rotten peers. I frightened them so much that they did not try to attack a second time. Hey, well, maybe they just didn't want to. Ivan Isaye from the village of Yaroslavsi raised his voice. After all, there are people like us among them. There are, of course, said Stoiko, but God knows when it will reach them. It will probably take a lot, Stanka, Ivan's sister, joined the conversation. Why are you digging so deep? Strati said ironically. The important thing is that we beat them, not whether there are own among them or not. Then it doesn't matter if there are ours there. Exclaimed Stanka Pivanova from Radomir district. This is the most important thing, comrades. Where do they recruit soldiers from? From the people, and people don't go willingly. It's not like the gendarmes. 
and among the soldiers there are a lot of resistance or even party members. They know what the party and the RMs expects of them. I saw with my own eyes that day how some soldiers were shooting in the air. I can only explain their reluctance by their reluctance that they stayed in the clearing all day doing nothing. Well, if your theory is correct, then why did the soldiers today shoot at the bridge, and on the highway where the brigade was, instead of firing into the sky? You saw our wounded, Stoiko said, displeased with the girl's reasoning. Stanka did not hesitate to answer. She explained the behaviour of the soldiers, firstly, by the fact that they had not yet realised everything, and secondly, that their superiors were standing over their heads, keeping an eye on them. In her opinion, if the soldiers wanted to, they had every opportunity to keep us off the bridge. No. So you think they showed Christian kindness, said Stocho. I can't agree with that. Only someone who has not seen the battle can agree to such a thing. We overcame the bridge only thanks to our superiority over the enemy, Ivan Izev said with conviction. Thanks to our high spirit, in our strength, one of the reasons for the lowering of spirit in the Tsarist troops. Therefore, dear comrades, he held himself as if at a meeting. Let us beat the enemy even more bravely. And raising a rod with pieces of meat strung on it, Ivan struck them in the air. Similar conversations took place at other campfires. And as the fighters quenched their hunger, their spirits rose, their tongues were loosened. Around midnight, the brigade left the clearing and set off again. At the end of the column tone, Todor Kosurkov led the horses. They had cowhides on their backs. Wet and heavy, they slipped and fell to the ground. Kosurkov picked them up, put them back on the horses. They fell again, and the column moved non-stop, waiting for no one. For the third day, people had not slept well. Many walked with their eyes closed by inertia, but when they tripped over a stump or a branch covered with earth, they instantly came to their senses. It became even harder when we entered the steeply sloping downhill mountain meadows. It was impossible to keep one's balance on the wet grass, and people fell every now and then. Some of them did it in such a way that the others couldn't help laughing. On a cold not a mite in the mountains, it is not very pleasant to walk in wet clothes. It was beginning to get light. It was time to look for shelter in the forest thickets, but there was no forest nearby. We must get to it before dawn anyway. He descended into a gorge. It was surrounded by tall, moss-covered pines. Dozens of huge trunks were lying on the ground like giants fallen in a bloody battle. From the point of view of defence, the place was not convenient at all, nor was it suitable for forced retreat, but it provided excellent camouflage, and we had not found the slightest sign that the enemy was on our trail. I decided to give the men a rest, but warned them that in three hours we would move on. They all crouched where the command had caught them. There was dead silence. Only occasionally the coughing of the sentries was heard. Three hours passed quickly, and the column was on its way again. Vast meadows opened before us. There were sorrel and wild onions. The soldiers plucked them and chewed them on the move, and those who were more prudent put them in their bags, stocking up for the whole day. The sky frowned. It began to rain. Heavy clouds hung over the forest, clung to the tops of trees. It became dark and mysterious. The birds hid somewhere. Even the ominous crows were frightened by this deadening environment. The column did not stop. It went on and on. The ascent began again. It was difficult to climb a steep slope, but the higher we climbed, the less frequent the clouds became, the weaker the rain. Suddenly the horizon moved away. About a kilometre away from us, some building whitened. Either a hunting lodge or a tourist hut. We were not mistaken. Moyes explained that it was the Macedonia campground, where he had stayed many times during his travels in Rila. Not a single door or window had survived in the hut. The police had made sure that the partisans could not use it. I ordered to check in, set up a guard, and we settled down for a rest. Some of us sat down, others lay down, and, in spite of the cold, fell asleep instantly. A great deal of snow, hard as stone, had piled up near the house. It easily held even the heaviest partisans. Belcho did not fall through. According to Moise Avramov, we were not far from Razlog. This was encouraging. Perhaps it would become easier with supplies, and soon we would be able to establish contact with the Razlog partisans. Here we said goodbye to our comrades from Batak. Serafimov, Punchev and Vasilev, and radio operators Saviononov and Pishev. The Batak comrades knew their future route well. 
and we hoped that they would deliver to Plovdiv the radio, which the party leadership was eagerly awaiting, and about which it had already been notified through various channels. This group set off before the brigade left the vicinity of the campground. We found it necessary to do this unnoticed by the fighters, especially since the brigade had left a lot of people, so it was necessary to be especially careful to observe conspiracy. However, it was not so much the absence of the group as the absence of Belcho that attracted the attention of the men. Where is Belcho? Where is he, our professor? They asked each other. During all these days and nights, the fighters watched the clever animal with interest and got used to him. A uh, pity, he was a good horse. They said, assuming that he was either lost or starved. But Belcho was not lost at all, and hunger had not starved him. At that time, he, together with his comrades from Batark and radio operators, were carrying out their mission, quietly, as if realizing that with his snorting he might give away the presence of the group with the radio. Belcho walked cautiously along the mountain paths that led to the valley of the Mester River. Somewhere there, the insidious enemy lurked in ambush. Belcho was killed and the fighters scattered in different directions. Before dawn, we had overcome one very dangerous place. The trail led us to a high, ice-covered cliff. We had to go down from it as if on a sled. This rapid descent was damped by thickets at the edge of the forest that grew at the foot of the rock. Near it, there was a bubbling rivulet, which ran straight out of the rock. The most convenient way to go further was along the bank of the river. Its bed was covered with many rounded stones. The stream beat against them, foamed, skirted around them, and rushed further, towards the Razloshkaya Valley. Our column followed the stream. We were also moving from stone to stone, avoiding uncomfortable places, hurrying to reach some village. But the village turned out to be so far away that we would not have enough time to return to the forest. So we decided to spend this day starving, hoping that at least the evening would bring us something pleasant. Everyone thought and talked about one thing only, where to get. From the small clearing where the brigade was camped, we could see the green surroundings of Razlog and Vansko. The Mester River snaked across the plain. At the foot of Ryla, Rodopa and Pirinai, on the plain rose to the sky the smoke of dozens of villages that had just awakened from Rila, Rodopa and sleep. What these villages were, we did not know. We hoped that Ferdinand Pudev, whose life we had spared, would help us to orient ourselves. It turned out, however, that he, a former teacher who had travelled the area, was unable to do so. Did he really not know, or was he deliberately keeping it secret, hatching some secret plan? You can expect anything from an anarchist. After we had failed with Pudev, Comrade Bolgaranov gathered the brigade commanders aside to discuss our future plans. Now was the most convenient moment to try to contact the Rezloch partisans. Not far from us sat a group of fighters. They were talking quite excitedly, from which we could conclude that some incident had happened. Yes, it cannot be, I do not allow such a thing, said a partisan from Radomir village to his neighbour. Whether you allow it or not, that's another question, the latter replied indignantly. But the fact is here. Sasho is not among us, and if he is, he has escaped. The Sasho in question was a boy from the village of Izor in Radomir district. He joined the brigade when we were passing through the forest near the village. Sasho was herding cattle there. When he noticed his classmates in the column, he left the herd and came with us, and then, like any random fellow traveller, he left us just as easily when he felt like it. If he'd just changed his mind, that's half the trouble. But as it turned out, he decided to surrender to the enemy. All day long the brigade was on guard. No one had the right to consider the boy's escape a mere desertion. Everyone had to foresee the worst-case scenario. We spent the whole day waiting for gendarmes or soldiers, but nothing happened until dusk. Sadly or well, the day passed. The sun had set, wetting the horizon, a sure sign that tomorrow would be clear and hot. The plan of taking over the nearest village was ready. We would have dinner there, stock up on food, and then head back to the mountains. It got dark. The brigade formed a column and moved quickly along the steep spur, on the crest of which the ruts from the wheels of carts were distinguishable. They ran down into the hollows covered with thorny thickets, then led through the stunted shrubbery, then came out into the flowering mountain meadows. There was complete silence in the column. Only from time to time someone's shoe-shod heel would clatter against a rock. Hey, why are you dragging your feet and making noise? I hear a disgruntled voice. This is on things I didn't do it on purpose. If the stone was in the way, what's my fault? We'll be heard in reply. You should watch, not sleep. 
comes an even angrier remark. Then it gets quiet again. So we walked for an hour. From the plane we could already smell the smell of stove smoke, and then we heard a dog barking. Soon it was village. Latan Pudev. Moyes and Timigva were in the lead. The last one was from the neighborhood of Dupnitsa. They walked about a hundred meters ahead, looking at every bush by the road, which ran along the narrow valley towards the village. It was coming. Suddenly an unfamiliar voice sounded, and immediately a rifle shot rang out. Our automatic rifle rattled after it. The shooting, having flared up, was rapidly increasing. The road to the village was guarded. The formation of the column allowed us to quickly deploy the brigade in combat order. It remained only to set battalions' tasks. Since the enemy took for defence oblong height dominating the village and its surroundings, the command decided the 1st Battalion would attack the height from the front, the 2nd from the valley on the right, the 3rd remained in reserve. We opened heavy fire on the enemy, but in the darkness it was difficult to reveal his grouping and plan. Therefore we had to rely on our own persistence more than anything else. The 1st Battalion, which attacked head-on, quickly broke the resistance and broke out to the top. Following him, the 2nd Battalion also reached it. Here we encountered the main force of an army unit that was climbing up the western slope. The soldiers lay down in the bushes and started shooting. In the first skirmish, we managed to take a prisoner. From him, we learned the password and the composition of the opposing unit. In addition, the prisoner said that the village was called Dobiesko and that the roads to the east of it were blocked by another battery from a military unit stationed in the town of Razlog. The fight broke out. Grenades were bursting. Our machine guns were not silent. We heard shouts. Who is coming? Password. Surrender. Hands up. The battle reached the highest point when the soldiers of the 1st and 2nd battalions, bypassing the enemy from the flanks, squeezed him in a pincer. Then followed the commandics. Forward. The guerrillas rushed into the attack. In just a few minutes the enemy was surrounded. Forty soldiers, two-thirds of the battery, were captured together with the commander. The rest continued to resist. Surrender, you are surrounded, we suggested, but in response, shots were fired. Clearly, their resistance must be broken by force. One of our machine gunners got close to the bushes where the soldiers were hiding and fired several long bursts. Surrender. The whole battery headed by the commander was captured. From him we learned that yesterday's deserter, a boy from the village of Izvor, informed the enemy not only about the location and composition of the brigade, but also of our intentions. Having received a report of this, the commander of the artillery division in Razlog gathered his combatants and ordered them to immediately load the personnel of the batteries onto vehicles and block the paths of our possible movement from the mountains. The batteries of Lieutenants Palamudov and Yashev were sent to the area of the village of Dobarsko. The latter positioned himself behind the village and Palamudov to the east of it. The commander of the first of these two batteries, conducting a reconnaissance, told the soldiers to settle down for the time being for dinner. Whether by accident or on purpose, they settled down exactly where we were to descend into the valley. At the same time, the lieutenants sent a group of soldiers to find a place convenient for an ambush. Our premature arrival upset Yakov's plans. Instead of ambushing us, his unit itself was at a severe disadvantage. Already when the patrols began to skirmish, Yakov decided to take the heights north of the road. When the battle was over and the assembly signal was given, most of the men did not respond to it. It turned out that some had gone to the village on their own initiative to look for food, while others had returned to the mountains unauthorized and sent messengers to look for the absent ones, but in most cases those sent did not return either. Thus, after the enemy was completely defeated, the soldiers were taken prisoners together with their weapons, the victory was achieved, when real possibilities of contacting the Razlovsky detachment opened up before us. Many could not stand it, succumbed to fatigue and left the brigade. Among those who distinguished themselves were two friends, friends Ferdinand Pudev and Dimitar Toshev, commander and commissar of the 2nd Battalion. Of course, everything could be expected from Pudev. That is how he revealed himself in his actions even in the little time he spent among us. The first days after the battle, near the village of Dobisko, everyone was tormented. First of all, the fact of the departure of so many people and the complete uncertainty of what had happened to them weighed on us, and secondly, depressed by the thought that we did not fulfill our task to the end. It was good that we still had a few men from the Dupnitsky detachment with us, including Moyes. 
Therefore, it was still possible to contact Gilo again. The long and difficult wanderings along the Rila began, from Dulipa to valley, from ridge to ridge. For a day we passed a dozen, one and a half kilometers, burning fires, listening to the slightest rustle. We would jump up in expectation and hope, even if the noise came from a bird looking for larvae in the dry branches of ancient pines. A day passed, a second, a third, e endless, joyless, hungry days. Nowhere did we meet a living soul. It was as if Rila had died out. Where had so many of our people gone? Where are the Razlogchans, the Garodzumayans? We'll never find them. Only on the third or fourth day, two of our partisans, Peter Maledov and Selsky, came out from behind a bush to meet us. They were the ones whom we had sent to the village after the battle to look for the fighters who had gone away. Although they were only two of so many missing, we were so happy that their return was a great event for you, and our questions lost the necessary rigour. Why didn't they come back at once? Where did they disappear to? It turns out that when they entered the village, they ran into two soldiers from Yachev's battery. One of the soldiers was wounded. The partisans talked to them, became friends and decided to go to the mountains. It seems that the soldiers agreed to Melodinov's proposal to become partisans more out of fear. Anyway, after climbing the mountains, they spent two days without food. The soldiers became despondent and began to say that, by the way, partisan life was very difficult and they could not endure it. These conversations aroused suspicion in our comrades, as if they had not done something bad. So they decided to take away the soldiers' weapons. Then one of the soldiers, the big one, ran away. Only the wounded one remained. He was even more frightened and begged to be released. Well, ours didn't object to that. After the meeting with Emadeinov and Selsky, we went to Dajumaiskaya Bistrita, the second largest river in the Rila Massif. On the way we got some food from shepherds' huts and satisfied our hunger. Before crossing the river, we stopped in a small forest. We had to look for a convenient ford to scout the situation beyond the river. We thought that the enemy had not discovered us. Nevertheless, we posted sentries around the camp, they carefully camouflaged themselves, and the rest of us settled down on the shelter. The night and morning hours in Rila are cold, so each of us looked forward to the appearance of the sun. It was the most pleasant and desirable for us in these endless mountain wilds and damp, gloomy crevices. Hey, who's coming? Stop. Suddenly called softly one of the sentries. Comrade Bolgarinov got up, listened, and said to me, Slava, go and see what happened there. My heart felt that the enemy had found us. I jumped up and approached the sentry from tree to tree. In front of him stood a short, swarthy peasant with a donkey. It turned out that he was from the village where we had been yesterday, but none of us had noticed him then. It appeared that he was either hiding or absent at that time. All this was a bit alarming, and we decided not to let him go. At the same time, we strengthened the security of the camp. In the evening, in total darkness, the column reached the river. Zlatan took a rope from the pack saddle, tied the peasant with it and led him a little farther away from the column. Now he will not run away from me. Hmm, said Zlatan, as if to ward off intrusive memories of his own guilt, of how he had allowed the soldier captured in the village of Dobriesko and the guide to run away from him when we were walking through Radomir region. You pulled him off very badly, Zlatan. Can't you see the man is barely breathing? We heard reply. It's all right. If the priest is tied up, the village is quiet. Zlatan, pleased with himself, answered, leading the peasant up the steep slope. In his fist, he clutched the end of a strong, well-twisted rope. The donkey tied to a tree was left behind. He looked sadly at his tied-up master, who looked back at his faithful assistant several times. After the incident in Radomir region, Zlatan's behavior was completely justified. So he did not let the peasant go, even though Zlatan seemed to feel sorry for him. We walked down to the river. It was smaller than the Rila River, but just as swift and turbulent. Its waters, a little murky, rushed from rock to rock. We found a ford. The river was wider in that place and the current was calmer. The banks are low, overgrown with grass. Hey, prepare to cross the river, Bolgaranov commanded. I took a long rope, which we kept in reserve. One end of it gave to a group of fighters. The other end was grabbed by me and Kozakov, Moai and Grigor from the village of Studen and moved across the current. It picked us up, but the four of us, by common efforts, kept on our feet. After us, one by one, the men of the brigade crossed the river, holding onto the rope as tightly as they could. 
Only one partisan just at the deepest place, the current tore off the rope and carried. She would have drowned if two men had not immediately rushed after her, and, having caught up with her, pulled her to the shore. Only a peasant was left behind, on the shore we had left. All this time, as if enchanted, he was watching us with wide open eyes. His hand involuntarily reached for his hat. He had evidently forgotten the offence he had suffered. He stood like that until we were out of sight. Eight, the distance from Bistrica to the Ryla River was covered in a few days. There was no trouble this time, except for the fact that it rained heavily one night and that we did not get much food. We made many attempts to contact the Dupnitsa partisans. We sent Moy and Porvan to the Yataks in the nearest villages, visited the places of all the former camps of the detachment, but found no trace of it. The fires were very old, all the ashes had been washed away by the rains. We considered it inexpedient to waste any more time here. It would be better if comrades Bolgaranov and Ninko Stefanov went to Sofia and from there establish contact with the party leadership in the Dupnitsa district. We parted with them near the village of Stobe after we had crossed the Ryla River for the second time. They went westward, we went northward. Beyond the river stretched vast orchards. A narrow road led through them, overhanging branches laden with ripe cherries. After the inhospitable mountains, it was hard to resist the temptation of the juicy berries. When we left the orchards and approached the village of Ryla, some unknown persons called our head sentry and told him to stop. Instead, he immediately lay down. The whole column followed. Who are you? asked an unfamiliar voice. No troops, replied the sentries. And who are you? Those are village guards. We are waiting for you, said two peasants with rifles who were hiding behind the boundary line. We are very touched by this, said ours, heading towards them. The guards were indeed waiting for some army unit. They were disarmed, their papers were taken, and they were ordered to lie face down on the ground until we passed. They immediately lay down flat and, I believe, conscientiously lay there until the end. This we did so that they could not count us. The day after Boyan Bolgaranov and Ninko Stefanov had left, the partisan who had accompanied them returned and brought a letter from Bolgaranov, in which he insisted that we should at all costs find the Dupnitsky detachment. Prime Minister was prompted by recent events. Prime Minister Bozilov had been replaced by Bagranov. This replacement was nothing but cheap demagogy. The development of events in the country forced the bourgeoisie to resort to another trick. It nominated for the post of Prime Minister a complete master of political equilibrium, Bagrayanov, who was presented as a pure and untainted by politics lamb. Bagrayanov resorted to demagogy as soon as he assumed his high office. Having set himself the task of destroying the guerrilla movement, he began by promising amnesty to all those who would lay down their arms and surrender to the authorities. We, although we had no ties with the party at that time, correctly assessed this political trick of the bourgeoisie and responded to it by tightening discipline and rallying the fighting rank. On one of those days, two Karakachans came to our camp. They were returning from Dupnitsa, where they had gone for flour. From them we learned that the Allies had finally landed in Normandy and some other news. In the evening the Karakachans took us to their camp. It consisted of a number of cone-shaped huts woven from beech branches like haystacks, dozens of large and small pots, some with sour cream, others with brinza, stood in rows under a vast canopy. On wide shelves were many carefully arranged circles of cheese. Each of them weighed from 5 to 15 kilograms. The Karakachans cordially offered us a treat. They had no bread, so we could choose between cheese, brinza and sour cream. Sour cream was the most tasty, sour and very thick. We didn't know some of its insidious properties, and hunger was pressing, so we piled on it and had enough. Then we gathered at the clearing, distributed among ourselves the purchased foodstuffs. It was time to go on our way. We shouldered our bags and other equipment and went, but not in a column, but huddled together so that the Karakachans could not find out exactly how many of us there were. However, we did not go far. People one after another threw themselves on the ground, complaining that their stomachs were bloated and it was impossible to take a step. Brigade Dr. Kosirkov was powerless to help them in any way. Only lying on his back a man felt even a little relief. So they decided to spend the night at the Karakan. It was a painful night. Some vomited, others could barely contain themselves. Yes, inappropriate food is worse than hunger. The morning didn't bring any change for the better. We had to stay here for the day. We took some measures for protection and reconnaissance and split into as many groups as there were huts. 
The herd was left to graze here not far from the cheese factory. One partisan was sent with the shepherd for control, and the Karakachans were forbidden to leave the herd without our permission. We also asked them to knead bread and prepare a light meat soup. It seemed to us that it would alleviate our suffering. The day passed without any event. The sour cream relapses died down little by little, and in the evening we left the Karakachan camp. We had enough hard cheese, butter, brinza, and bread for a few days. The problem of food again became paramount. As for finding the stragglers and scattered partisans, there was nothing to dream of. About Dimitar Pashilinsky and Georgi Nastev we did not even remember, and now, unexpectedly for all of us, we met them. Exhausted but happy, they told us the story of their wanderings. Not reaching the village of German, Bogdan Boshkov and Kamdov separated from the group, as it was agreed in advance, in order to move to the Radomir detachment. The rest of the comrades entered the village, put sentries at the outskirts and near the community building, and went home to collect provisions. Some time later, the sentry at the community fired a shot, signalling a danger signal, by which the group had to gather at the agreed place. When they gathered, it turned out that three men were missing. Now Stephen Pachelinski thought that these three were late on purpose. So they did not wait for them, and there was no time for that. The soldiers were entering the village. Already in the mountains, on the way to the designated meeting point with the brigade, the group was fired upon. The soldiers hurried to take cover in the nearest forest. Fearing encirclement, Pchelinski allocated two men for reconnaissance. We waited for them until evening. They did not return. They sent two more men the same story. It was extremely risky to stay further in the forest. We had to move to another place. There the comrades decided to try to establish contact with local party members. For this purpose, the fighter Alanov was told to go down to the village of Balanovo, where he had acquaintances. Whether Alanov fulfilled the task or not is unknown. He did not come back. Then Peshelinsky and Nastiv had the idea to divide the group into twos and threes. Each group should move independently, according to the conditions. T to make these groups more manoeuvrable, the commander and the commissar took the rifles and the only machine gun from the soldiers and buried them in the ground. Having disbanded the fighters, Pischelinski and Nastiv headed in the direction of Kyustin. They hoped, using their former connections, to establish contact with the party representatives at least there. On the road they met Azen Oransky, who stayed with the sick and wounded soldiers of the brigade. He told them in what approximate place they could find us. Then Pischelinski and Nastiv returned, dug out a machine gun, and after wandering in the mountains for a few more days, though by chance, but still came upon us. Both to us and to them this meeting gave a lot of joy. However, Comrade Speshelinsky and Nastiv had to listen to a lot of harsh words for having disbanded the fighters and taken away their weapons. Shelinsky and Nastiv could not help us in our search for communication with the detachment of Zilo Demirevsky. Again, we had to rely on chance. And then one day we managed to meet Azen of Orange again. He was at home in Ryla, fearlessly penetrating into the most remote places. His appearance in the brigade brought a new joy. The prospect of establishing a link with the party and Zelo Demirisky now seemed more real than ever. Likewise, the prospects for our supply had also changed. One evening, when we had run out of food, we visited the Karakachans again. This time we dug in, except with disgust, we did not look at the sour cream. Having taken provisions, we were about to pay when the elder of the Karakachans wrote, I don't need money from you. Give me a receipt so that I could justify myself before the master and when you come to power, then we will settle accounts. I wondered how the Karakachan knew about the receipts we used in Trine District. The word of mouth was spreading, people were talking about it. I gave him a receipt for several tens of thousands of lever, signed and sealed, everything as it should be, and that was the end of it. But not for long. In those days this cheese factory was the only source of food for us, so we had to go there several more times. Each time we gave a receipt for the food, in this way, our receipts became a solid document that strengthened the population's faith in the near victory over fascism. Until the end of June, we stayed in Ryla in one place, without a single action. Our only concern was the search for food. Of course, during these days, Yonko Panov made a number of reports, both on the international situation and on other matters of concern to the partisans, but this could not take up all the time. From the unusually long rest and calorie-laden food, each of us had a lot of energy stored up and was looking for an outlet. 
I must confess that I was not at all happy to be stuck in Rilala like this. I did it only by virtue of Bolgarinov's orders. Inactivity and the unknown weighed on me, and I twice put before the party organization the question of the brigade's return to Trinska or Kolya. And if at the first meeting my proposal was rejected, at the second it was accepted. At the end of June we divided the brigade into two parts. One, under the leadership of the Chief of Staff, remained in Rila to continue trying to find Zeljo Demiriski's detachment, and the other, under my leadership, went to Trenska Okia. Later, the comrades who remained in Rila managed to establish contact with the Rezlochevsky detachment, and together they carried out a major action against the German garrison in the village of Pestre, near the Rila monastery. My group included partisans from the Trenska, Radomir and Breznica Okoliai. There were also Kirill Markov from Vidinska and Angel Dafinkichev from Belogradchik or Collier. It was agreed with the Pimai that they would go to their regions and join the detachments operating there, or, if there were no detachments there yet, try to create them. On the morning of July 1, the fighters of both groups bid each other a hearty farewell. With us went Azen Aransky, we had him for a guide, and Tador Kusikov, the brigade doctor. The other doctor, Georgi Nastiv, stayed in Rila, our group moved northward. We wanted to get to Verila, which connects the Rila Massif with Vigosha, and then turn to Trine. After two days we descended into the Dupnitsa Valley. Here Aeson of Orange bade us farewell, and we walked along the gentle slopes of the Verila, which led us to Jerebkovica, a small mountain village belonging to the Samakov district. Day by day we approached our goal, near the village of Lyrek Pyotr Kirizanin, an old party worker from the village of Drep in Radomir district, and comrades Kirill, Boicho, Risto, Stanka Pevanva, Nadka, Filka, and Agpa, who wished to join the Radomir detachment, separated from the group, while the rest of us headed for the village of Studena in Sofia district. We crossed the Sofia Pernik Railroad, crossed the Struma River, and dawn found us in the vicinity of the village of Railovo, four kilometers from the Pernik mines. There was no forest there, the crops were thin, and the mowing season was in full swing. Not far away was Mount Lulin, but if we went to it, we would deviate from the route, and it would take us at least an hour, it was getting light, so this did not suit us at all. We had to take shelter in a sparse shrubbery. On three sides of the thicket there were mown fields. The grass on them had already been gathered into clumps, and on the fourth eastern side there were barley crops wet with dew. The place, of course, was not very convenient and did not provide complete safety, but we had no choice. We decided to resort to cunning. We hung multicolored wires on the branches. If any of the curious people would get attached, we would say that we were soldiers. We would try out the new German radio equipment, which allows us to detect foreign planes invading the Bulgarian airspace. We were counting on our paramilitary clothing to help us. This quite plausible version had only one weak link, the guerrilla girls. But we covered them with cloths. Here, they say, there is equipment that no outsider is allowed to see and sundry predictions do not come true, but there are still cases when it turns out exactly as expected, and this time everything came true. The sun rose, gilded the high hills, and quickly floated between the whitish clouds. Two cows appeared from the village. They stepped into the meadow and began to eat the thick, tall grass. A barefoot boy in a wide-brimmed hat was watching them. In his right hand he held a long walnut stick, with which he whipped at the bushes to scare the birds. On his left shoulder hung two leather bridles taken off the cows. The mowers appeared scattered across the meadow. Large flocks of sheep could be seen on the slope. From the direction of Pernik came the hum of the factory. A day of labor was beginning. Little by little the cows approached our thickets, stayed near the edge of the forest where the grass remained uncut. Near them, leaning on a stick, the boy froze, took out his knife and began to trim a twig. We were silent, waiting impatiently for him to come behind the bush and see us he would probably shriek with surprise. One of his charges, having eaten the grass near the bushes, got close to the crops and, taking advantage of the fact that the boy was not paying attention to her, filled her mouth with milk ears. The other one was not far behind her, and they raced to the barley, as if sensing that they were about to be chased away. When the boy noticed what they were doing, he ran up to the cows, swung his stick, and chased them away. They moved on across the mowed meadow, and he, as if he had no guilt behind him, came to the bushes with an independent look, pushed the branches apart. Now he was all in front of us. His face was sunburned, and his skin was peeling on his upturned nose. 
The unexpected meeting with so many strangers dazed the boy. At first he even became numb. Then he shrieked loudly and ran down the meadow. Why are you there? What's the matter? The tall mower called out to him anxiously. There are soldiers in the bushes. Lots of soldiers. He shouted on the run, pointing in our direction. We looked at each other as if to consult what to do. I thought it wise not to lurk any longer. One of us had to get out of the thicket. Perhaps the best person to do it is Zarkov. He is wearing a cavalry uniform with all the insignia. He has even kept his epaulets and white harness. My close to military. A man who is not very familiar with army life is unlikely to recognize the difference. Zarkov went towards the mower and the boy, speaking as he went. What kind of soldier will come out of you if you are afraid of soldiers? We are not scary. We are from the pit. What can I take from him, from a boy? Replied the mower. He didn't expect to see you there, so he got scared. It was obvious that it was the boy's father who wanted to calm him down. Vasil greeted the adult by the hand, stroked the boy's head and sat down on the hill. The mower also lowered himself down next to him. What brought you here? Asked the peasant. We are testing a new station for intercepting foreign airplanes. It is German, very complicated, but it detects the slightest noise of an airplane flying into our territory. Where are you from? Vasco asked in turn, in order to stop further questioning. Over there, from Raylov. He waved his hand at an oblong hill, from behind which the roofs of several houses could be seen. I'm a carpenter working at the mine, but I decided to take a day off today. We need to stock up on hay, too. Yes, of course, Basil agreed, signalling me to come over. Well, have you got any signals? Yes, Mr. Non-Commissioned Officer. The red arrow moved and deflected thirty degrees. Hey, I see, I see, said Zarkov. Well, there is still time. We have time to follow the enemy. Let Boris watch and you come here. I loudly passed Boris' order, Mr. Non-Commissioned Officer, and, coming up, sat down near them. The Mauer asked in detail where we were from, how long we had been serving, told me that he himself had served, and that the field officer had beaten him for laziness. Oh, oh, what thieves these field officers are. Even with some admiration, said the mower, and immediately told us how his lieutenant had stolen two blankets. The field field bell liked the handwriting of our interlocutor, and when he passed the recruit course, he was taken to the company office. Felfil entrusted him with the keys to the stores, one with new and the other with discarded property. Though our acquaintance took the warehouses without any inventory, they sorted out all the things one by one there, put in such order, which the field bill had not seen for a long time. This softened the chief's heart even more. One day the field bill called the storekeeper and said, Listen to me. Go to the warehouse with discarded property, pick up their two better blankets, then go behind the stable and give them to the field fellbill of the second company. He'll give you two new blankets in return. You'll leave them in my room, and tomorrow night you'll take them to my house. Is that clear? Yes, Mr. Field Felvel, replied the storekeeper and immediately carried out the order of the company father. From that time on, the mower told us, I can't think well of field officers. These types, if necessary, will steal a child from its own mother. Apparently our appearance here did not arouse the peasant's suspicions, and we spent a good deal of time with him. We beat his scythe, walked a few rows with it ourselves, and became buddies. That's how we spent the day near the village of Raylova, and in the evening, as soon as it got dark, we went to Raznik. On the way we passed through the churchyard of Divatino village and found ourselves in front of the pernik voluyuek railroad line, which was being extended to Rasnik. By the distant barking of dogs, we determined which way was the outskirts of the village. There were many koshas in its vicinity. In order not to run into them, we barked several times in the dog's manner. The sheepdogs immediately responded, and it was easy for us to orientate ourselves where to go, to the left or to the right. So we managed to safely pass the Rasnik Akosharaz, and soon we came to the hayloft of our glorious Yatak Boris Modrev. The ability to imitate the barking of dogs, hunting or guard dogs, helped us many times to avoid danger at night. Luckily for us, Boris had just returned from retraining for reserve soldiers. He made a fuss, brought bread, brinza, sourdough, eggs. For the first time since we had gone to Ryla's, we were able to eat in a human way. We also saw Stojan Tenev. He was well informed about the situation both at the fronts and in the country. 
Most of all, however, we were interested in the fate of the 2nd Brigade. However scanty the information Comrade Tenev had, we realized that it had also suffered heavy losses and had not been able to reach its designated area. This alarmed me very much. Yes, it is necessary to get as soon as possible to Trainska Okolya, where, no doubt, they know immeasurably more and more accurately. In Rasnik, Kirill Markov and Angel Dafinkishev, a tanker, separated from the group. They were going to Sofia, where they could change into civilian clothes in the apartment of the Prishev family, and then they would go, whoever could, to their own laun. Zlatan to Vidinskaya Okolya, Angel to Belogradchikskaya Okolya. The same night we went onward. We went around Bresnik from the north and just before dawn, we reached the vicinity of the village of Giolo, four kilometers from the town. There are no forests in this area. The only place where the group could hide was a small acacia grove to the west of the village. That's where we stayed. I strictly forbade any kind of talking, clinking of weapons, forbade even coughing and sneezing. Only absolute silence could in some measure guarantee that we would not be discovered. In the afternoon sheep appeared near the grove, and with them dogs. They smelled us and barked, which attracted the attention of the shepherd, a lad of fifteen. He approached the edge of the forest and began to look between the trees. The boy had reason to be. His brother Strati had also joined the partisans, and the boy hoped that after a long separation he would have a happy chance to see his brother, to embrace him, to tell him what their family had gone through when they were persecuted by the police, to tell him about their fellow villagers who had died. One cannot remain indifferent when seeing such a meeting, when joy and tears mix, when a dream comes true. This meeting was joyful for all of us because everyone was waiting with hope for the same brothers and sisters, who not once and not twice heard from the mouth of the enemy that we were destroyed, wiped out from the face of the earth. Now everyone could imagine their meeting with their loved ones, who had been led to believe that we were no longer alive. Strati too could not contain his excitement, and cried when his brother rushed to him and put his weak arms around his neck. The brothers stood like that for a long time, embraced, speechless. How is mum? What's at home? Strati asked, having mastered himself. The boy was silent. He had not yet come to his senses, had not heard what his brother was asking. What's at home? Mother, father, how are they? Are they alive? He repeated. Alive, the boy answered as if in a dream. He lowered his hands, stood in front of Strati with a face swollen with tears. Having calmed down a little, the boy told about the latest news that he had heard, and then hurried to his bilince to find out how it was and to tell his parents the good news that Strati, Stoshacho, Ivan, Stanka, Magvileta and other partisans from Bresnik, Skoja, Okolia were alive and would soon see their relatives. In the evening our group Blockaded Girlo seized the cheese factory and distributed cheese, butter and brinza to the peasants. This, of course, was not our main goal. With this action we sought to inform the population as soon as possible that the 1st Sophia Brigade was alive, that it would strike with unrelenting force against the fascist power. This news should reach all our yataks, all young men and women, partisans who remain to act in the local area. Further advancement of the group, meetings with the inhabitants of Milky of Sea, Hohovika and other villages, with our yataks encouraged them. The rumours spread by the authorities that we were defeated and outnumbered were exposed to the end. Now the fascists had no hope that they could escape death. As soon as we set foot on the territory of Bresnik and Trine, we began to act. We carried out an action in the village of Girlo, disarmed an officer in Hlohovis, and organized a meeting in Mislovstis. Here we were in our element. The second brigade, just like the first brigade, had to fight hard. The enemy was watching its every move, wherever it was possible to set up ambushes. One of them was waiting for the brigade at the top of Com. After holding an action in the villages of Govichdar and Diljidel, where Dencho tried to establish contact with the detachment operating in the area of Mihailovgrad and Berkovica, the brigade headed for MT, Com. The peasants who tried to find the local detachment were unsuccessful, and therefore the brigade had no reason to stay longer in one place. At the foot of the mountain the fighters found several cheese factories. It was hard to resist the temptation, and not to taste the cheese and brinza, which are famous for their high quality. The brigade began the ascent to the top. The column was led by Delcho, followed by partisans from the Levski battalion, then Botevsi. 
They did not know that the enemy had occupied the summit before daylight and set up ambushes on all the places and paths accessible from the south side. The soldiers hollowed out their cells and camouflaged them well. But, apparently, some of them got tired of sitting in the trenches, so they came out, their grey silhouette showing against the sky. Hey, who are they? Delcho called out. Who are you? replied the soldiers, not slowing down to Opaya. Us began firing as well. One of the soldiers who remained in the ambush reached out and stabbed Delcho in the shoulder with his bayonet, then a second time, then a third. Feeling great pain, Delcho called for help from his comrades and immediately, firing a line from a machine gun, killed the enemy in the trench, then transferred the fire to the silhouettes on the trail. Then the soldiers who were at the head of the column came up, scoured the whole area with automatic rifles, cleared the way to the top. On the opposite slope, the brigade descended to the Ginskaya River, got out on the new road, which the soldiers of construction battalions in 1935 laid to Petrohan, the watershed of the Stara Planina mountain massif. Dawn found the column in the vicinity of the Petrohan horse farm. In the morning, observers reported to Delcho that they had seen soldiers saddling horses not far from the brigade camp. This alarmed the brigade commanders who decided to withdraw immediately. The days of May 20, 21 and 22 were very tense. March, march and march. There was no thought of rest. The brigade, as they say, had police, gendarmes and army units on its tail. At least the enemy could not always accurately predict where the brigade would move next. Probably that's why it was easy to cross the Iskai River. Comrades turned in flight, the soldiers' constructors guarding the suspension bridge on both banks and crossed it. It was impossible to go further without a guide from the locals. They decided to mobilize for this purpose, the first one who came across. And we met not only one, but two of them at once, and brothers at that. They told everything they knew about the concentration of troops, and comrades Vado Trichkov and Blagoy Ivanov decided that the only thing that could help the partisans in this situation was to take refuge in the dense forest. The peasants led them to the northeast of the village of Batulia. The brigade entered the forest dark and silent. To all appearances, no one else had passed through here. The command to rest was given, fatigue quickly washed over the soldiers. They went to their peasants, disappeared. They went to their homes. On the way they were intercepted by the Polizi, who hurried to occupy the heights above the forest, where the brigade stopped. Voluntarily or under compulsion, it is not known. Only the peasants reported the partisans. Unnoticed by the sentries, the Polizi and gendarmes approached the camp. There, tired from the long and arduous crossing, almost everyone was sleeping a deep sleep. At three o'clock in the afternoon, a huge round stone rolled into the camp with a crack and a rumble, and immediately rifles and machine guns crackled. Grenades exploded. Shouts were heard. The guerrillas jumped up. The sudden attack at first stunned them. But they quickly came to their senses and returned fire. Shots and explosions resounded in the thick oak forest, Bullets whistled, knocked leaves fell from the branches. The enemy pressed from all sides. The partisans fiercely resisted. But painfully uncomfortable for defence was that place. Following the orders of Vlado Trichkov, the brigade tried to ravine to get out of the encirclement. However, the enemy had foreseen it. The ravine, as well as all other possible escape routes, was blocked. It became difficult to distinguish anything in the forest. Gunpowder smoke, earth and dust blown up by explosions, just like autumn leaf fall. For more than two hours, the battle continued. Both sides suffered losses. The enemy deeply cut into the brigade's fighting order tore it. Scattered groups of guerrillas even more difficult to get out of the ring of fire. The enemy clearly took the upper hand. He pursued and surrounded separate groups of fighters. More than 40 guerrillas died. In this battle fell Jordan Nikolova, Vlado Trichkov, Nasho Ivanov, Daicho Petrov, Gocho Gopin, the head of the British mission, Major Thompson, many other partisans and partisan women. The group led by Dencho managed to break through the encirclement and return to Trisker Kolya. Another group, with Blagoy Ivanov, Delcho Simov and Vera Nacheva at its head, made its way to Plovdiv and established contact with the partisans of the Middle Ages. Trifon Balkansky, with a group of fighters from the Chavdar detachment and the 2nd Brigade went to Yugoslavia. In these campaigns, the 1st and 2nd Brigades travelled hundreds of kilometres in unfamiliar terrain, fighting hard. For several days, the soldiers did not have a crumb in their mouths, but the guerrillas crushed the enemy, made their way.
It should be noted that the tasks of these campaigns were not fully accomplished. The 1st Brigade was not able to make timely contact with the Raslosh and Gornajumai units and go down the valley of the Struma River, and the 2nd Brigade did not reach the area of Plovdiv. Both combat units suffered heavy losses. Even then, there were people who condemned these deep raids, which allegedly did not justify the sacrifices made, tried to belittle the importance of the raids, called them adventurism. But could two large partisan units, against which the fascists had concentrated large forces with the intention of encircling them and destroying them, operate within the littered framework of two or three Oakley? And could such a brutal struggle, the struggle against fascism, have been without sacrifices? Were these sacrifices not redeemed by the fact that the occupiers were forced to leave our country? Fascism was defeated and the Bulgarian people were forever free from the German robbers. What was positive in these campaigns? What did the partisan movement gain from them? First, the brigades raised the entire population of the areas through which they moved, inspired in them the faith in victory, because people for the first time saw large partisan units, well armed and organized on the principle of a cadre army, in the areas through which the brigades passed. Many new partisans joined them, new units emerged. Secondly, we forced the enemy to disperse his forces. If both brigades had remained in the area of Trine, we would have had to fight heavy, disadvantaged Jews for us with the already concentrated, taking the initial position of the Tsarist army, which had artillery, cavalry, aviation tactics that we used, forced the enemy to unclench his fist. One part of the enemy forces were diverted to the second brigade, another, the first part of the forces were thrown into the pursuit of Macedonian and Yugoslav partisans. Thus, completely failed the plan of the fascist command to encircle us in a small area and defeat us. Thirdly, both brigades introduced the partisans of the areas through which they passed to a new tactic, not to hide in the forests but to act boldly, blockade villages, disperse the fascist administration and create the organs of the Fatherland Front, the organs of the future people's power. The major action of the real Apirin detachment, which included several dozen partisans and part of the command of the 1st Brigade, undertaken in August against the German garrison in the valley of the Rila River, was carried out precisely in accordance with this tact. The automatic weapons which the 1st Brigade delivered to the Rila Apirin detachment also played an important part. These are the positive results of the campaigns of the 1st and 2nd Brigades, the significance of which should not be downplayed. On July 14 at night, we visited our Yatochka Aunt Bojana. She was in mourning. Rumours had reached her as if we had been outgunned and she had stopped eating, laughing, having fun. You can imagine her joy when she saw us. She even cried. Oh, oh my children, where have you disappeared? Where have you disappeared? Those bastards got wind of your absence and raised their heads again. They tore their hats off when they found out you were killed. And what will they say when they find out that we have been resurrected? Peter Emeladinov asked. They'll choke on the bone, replied Velko. Not a bone, but a crooked limb, added Ivan Yaroslavsky. Hey, it's been a long time since I fired a pistol. I'd like to discharge it into some fascist's face, said the mustachioed Stocho. That's all they deserve, Aunt Bozana added. Then she turned to me and asked. Have you seen Dencho? Where could we have seen each other? We had gone in different directions. Here he is. He gave me some news about him the other day, said Aunt Bajana. Hmm. So Dencho is alive. We cried out with one voice. Where is he? Probably near the village. Ask Guro. He knows where their camp is. What the Yatache said was enough. Joyful. We went to Juro Semov's house. Dencho has just left. These were the first words of Bai Juro. We got even more excited. We should hurry up. Petr Maladipov said reproachfully, we would have caught him. But perhaps the most important thing was that Dencho was alive and well, and we could meet him at any moment, no matter how big the Boko forest was. We had the same thoughts, the same goals, which had brought us here after long and difficult wanderings in Rila and Stara Plantsha. All this brought us closer to each other, and the possibility of a meeting became a reality. We agreed with Baiduro that we would go to the Teskovitz tract and his granddaughter Torka would drive the cattle to the borderline and look for Dencho at the site of our old camp in the Jasenica tract. Among other news we learned about the rearrest of Luba, a neighbour of Aunt Bajana. 
Probably the girl's love for the partisans took precedence over the meanness she was supposed to commit according to the instructions of the police. Luba refused to carry them out, and the agents took her out so that their plan would not be thwarted. The news about Dencho made me very happy. The old dreams that had once possessed us came back to life. The struggle had brought us so close together that we felt as if we were breathing with the same lungs and the same heart was beating in our bodies. There were no secrets between us. What one knew, the other knew. We were so close that we could guess what each of us was thinking. I, for example, was sure that his first words when we met would be, be Slava, we can't be apart. When I'm with you, I'm somehow calmer, and then he'd tell me about his misfortunes. There is no way that he could not share with me absolutely everything that he had experienced. Everything was the same in Tescovac, the same green outfit in which we had left it in May, the same bird songs that we heard in spring, and the same aroma of grasses lining the small forest glades. Only the rivulet has changed, and the crops have taken on a different hue. Instead of the muddy streams of May, the water was now fast and clear, and there was less of it after the June heat, and the rye and oats were golden. The sun looked into the clearing where we camped, hot, even scorching. After a long absence, after so much suffering, it was so pleasant and cheerful here. It seemed to us that the grass, the forest, the water, the blackbirds, and the songbirds singing in the bushes welcomed us as long-awaited guests. Once here in Tescovitz, we would gather together fifteen or twenty shepherds, let the cattle go into the forest, and either look for birds' nests or block the rivulet with sand and grass, so that soon there was a lake in front of the dam. Then we gathered near it and, pushing each other, waited for the dam to be washed away and the freed stream to rush through it. Memories of this involuntarily came to mind, and again and again I mentally returned to the days of my childhood, to everything that is forever connected for me with the fabulous Tescovitz. Was there not a particle of it in the great thing that drew me powerfully to my native place when we were in Ryla? And can there be a homeland without such places dear to my heart? Jasenica was quiet. Only the crackling of dry twigs could be heard. Densho's partisans observed complete silence. What could it be? Densho asked himself. The last thing we need is to be discovered. Talker signalled. No one answered. She repeated it. Densho listened. It's someone inside, he said almost in a whisper, rising on his arms. He looked where the signal had come from, but saw nothing. The signal came again, a slight noise, and Dencho saw a little girl. She beckoned to him with her hand, and he headed towards the pair. What's the matter with you? Is there no danger? He asked excitedly. No, I have joy for you. Uncle Slavcho is here, the girl replied smiling. Hmm, Slavcho who? Dencho said in surprise. Yes, our Uncle Slavcho, the partisan. Slavcho Bokovsky or Slavcho Ranilovsky? Dencho continued to ask incredulously. Machovsky. The girl confirmed. Listen, Tala, let's not joke. Slavcho is in Rila. There's no way he'll come back. Dencho stood his ground. No, Jesus, exclaimed the girl. How can I assure you that he is there in Tescovac? Dencho finally believed hugged the girl, kissed her for joy and immediately returned to the camp. Mm, comrades, he shouted from afar. Slavi is back. Hurrah. Slavi is back. I'm going to him. Let the bastards hold on now. Dencho took one of the partisans with him and went straight to Tescovitz. We shouldn't, Dencho said, was. We shouldn't have separated from you. Maybe if we had been together, what happened wouldn't have happened. Yes, our friendship of many years had brought us together so much that we understood each other even without words. As soon as the village learned of our return, many boys, girls, women and guys came to Tescovitz. The remote tract of land came to life. It became even a bit solemn. People talked cordially. Peasants mourned for their dead comrades, expressed confidence in the near victory. Agitation and outreach work was one of the indispensable elements of our activity. So we instructed the local Remsists to immediately prepare a village meeting. In the evening, a new celebration took place in the small square. Two partisan columns, one from the first and the other from the second Sophia brigades, came down here along the two roads leading from the mountains. On the square, the columns came together. The partisans stretched out their hands to each other. The combat friends hugged each other tightly. Here, as they say, there was no place to fall. Old and young hurried to look at the guerrillas, shake their hands, wish them success. For two whole months, 
The peasants heard from the fascist messages about us are one more terrible than the other, and now the deep sadness for the people's fighters was replaced by a storm of unbridled joy. It sought an outlet in songs and choral. The revelry continued until deep into the night. Having gathered all the retired fighters, having established order and discipline, we drew up a plan of future action on the scheme depicting the Trenska and Bresnica Okoli. There are small circles, arrows winding in different directions, flags, squares and other icons, each of which has its own absolutely definite meaning. With their help, future political and combat actions of the detachment and its manoeuvring are indicated, ensuring the rapid mastery of the territory, the dispersal of the fascist administration, and the establishment of the legal authority of the Fatherland Front. An important factor contributing to the realization of all these operations was the rapid advance of the Red Army to the Bulgarian borders. It gave us new strength, determination, and firm faith. In June, while there were no partisan detachments in the Okalyaya, the enemy raised its head. Unfortunately, traitors were found in the villages of Regenopsi, Jintropsi, and Stoikopsi, and the police and gendarmes went on the rampage. About 20 partisans and partisan women were shot in the vicinity of Stresimiropsi and in one other. Among them were those who, for various reasons, had fallen behind our two brigades, as well as Macedonian and Yugoslav partisans captured by the police on May 12, when the Macedonian brigades were crossing the Trinska Okulia. In Erul, our best Chitaks were killed. The brave, fearless violator Jakova also died. The caring maternal care of grandmother Milanka from the village of Vidra helped Ivanka to quickly cope with her illness. Barely rising to her feet, she immediately asked us, where should I go? This did not bother us. Knowing her courage and ability to work with young people, we decided to send her to Radomir Okoli as a leader of the RMs. When discussing this issue, we also took into account the fact that she and Slavsho worked together in Sofia, knew and understood each other very well. And this is very important. Under Ivanka's leadership, the Radomir Remzists quickly became more active. The struggle became mass. Since May, a detachment began to operate in the Okolia. Partisans cut telephone wires, destroyed cheese factories, burned community archives, dispersed requisition commissions. On a warm night in June, when the moon was flooding the fields with its rays and the cicadas were crackling merrily on the roadside, Ivaika and a boy from the village of Coptifray were on their way to the village of Jatusha. Suddenly a policeman appeared in front of them. His hand was resting on his holster. Ivanka was not confused. More than once she had already managed to cope with the enemy. But here she was a moment too late. The policeman grabbed the gun and forced them to turn their backs. They tried to explain to him that they were civilians, going about their business to no avail. The policeman arrested them and took them to the village. Many people gathered in the square. Some came out of curiosity, others out of sympathy. With guns at the ready, the fascists from the village guards surrounded the arrested men and prepared to search them. So the situation was becoming very serious. Ivanka was aware of the danger, but kept her composure. She believed that with the necessary restraint and equanimity one could get out of even the most seemingly hopeless situation. Without wasting any more time, she took out her pistol and opened fire on the village guards. The guy accompanying Ivanka also drew his pistol, but in his haste he didn't take the safety off the trigger. He should have remembered that and used the gun too, but he rushed to run down the highway. Ivanka was left alone against a group of armed enemies. Maneuvering in the crowd, she managed to take down three fascists. Panic broke out in the crowd. Some shouted, others cried, others rushed away from the scene of the shooting. At this time, admiring the heroism of the girl, a few guys pelted the guards with a hail of stones. It was already an effective support. Squatting down, Ivanka began to aim more accurately. But the clip was out of ammunition. She had to get a spare, and it was in the bag behind her back. Ivanka already reached for it as she felt a sharp blow on her arm. The girl flinched. She saw a stout headman standing beside her. Throwing away the stick with which he had just struck Ivanka, he pounced on her and took away the gun. Now she was left with her bare hands. She tried to defend herself with her teeth, bit the headman several times, he screamed, others came to his aid. In an unequal struggle, the fascists overpowered the girl and threw her to the ground. This was the beginning of her hellish tortures. The fascists beat the girl for a long time, then dispersed, leaving only a sentry with her. They did not allow Ivanka to come to her senses. There was nothing left alive on her, 
her whole body was covered with blood. The girl lay motionless for a long time, like a corpse. But her heart was beating. Not immediately, but she regained consciousness. She opened her eyes with difficulty. There was no one around. The moon was peeping through the thick willows. Like a mother, she leaned over the girl, caressing her with her light. Gathering all her strengths, Ivanka lifted herself up, looked again into the dense shadows under the trees, saw no one, got to her feet, and limping, moved along the road that led to the field. The gang, however, was not far away, watching their victim. Only Ivanka made a few steps, as from behind the trees simultaneously rumbled several guns. The girl swayed, her legs shook, she fell. The guards rushed to her. One of them, the most diligent, shook her, shouted. Alive. Take her to the community, ordered the headman. We'll continue the interrogation there. I think she's pretending to run away again. Several policemen picked up the badly wounded gorilla and dragged her across the square. When they threw her on the floor of the community building, Ivanka was barely breathing. One of the torturers took out a dogwood stick and shoved it at the headman. Now tell me who you are and how many of you are in the squad. He shouted, swinging the stick. Ivanka was silent. Do you hear what they're asking you? Answer me or I'll kill you. Without waiting for an answer, the headman hit Ivanka on the shoulder with the stick with all his might. She twitched, but still silently continued to stare at the electric bulb that swayed on a long cord hanging from the ceiling. Suddenly the bulb went out. Darkness reigned. Several murky silhouettes bent over the half-living girl. Their arms looked like long scythes, which from time to time rose into the air and then dropped to the floor again. Mel, tell me who you are and how many of you there are. The headman gritted his teeth. Otherwise I'll beat you till your arms are tired. A vain threat. Except for quiet moans, the murderers heard nothing from Ivanka. The light bulb came back on. The torturers recoiled, but the girl didn't open her eyes. All for nothing, she never said anything, growled the headman. In the morning, a whole platoon of policemen arrived in the village in a truck. They dragged Ivanka out of the chancellery and threw her into the back of the car like a cube. But as the police car raced towards the town, the girl was still alive. From time to time, consciousness returned to her. At one such moment, she realized that her strength was failing her, and that new agonies awaited her at the Oakley police station where she was being taken, of course. Along the sides of the truck sat densely policemen. Their boots gave off a stifling stench. The scent of wildflowers could not penetrate through it to the girl, who lay at the feet of the policeman, the scent of wildflowers, the one she had freely inhaled with her whole chest last night, when she and her boyfriend had left Condefray and were walking briskly towards Vetusha. During another flash of consciousness, what she had done flashed before Ivanka. It seemed to her that it was not enough for a normal human life, but more than enough for a short one. And how long have I lived? she thought. Has it really been an eternity? I seem to have been young after all. I must have made a mistake in something. Something was jumbled, something was out of place. She opened her eyes to find out, to see once more what was so dear and lovely to her, to rejoice one last time in the wonderful nature, to look at the people with whom she had shared her youth, but she saw nothing else but blue police overcoats. The sharp stench of boots took her breath away, and she squeezed her eyes shut again. Now it seemed to her that the intoxicating scent of flowers, the flowers of youth, was wafting from the fields. A happy smile touched her lips, and with that smile, invincible and commanding, she closed her brown eyes forever. The appearance of the partisan detachment greatly disturbed the Trinian authorities. They realized that it would create a lot of worries for them, that no matter what forces they could throw against it, with the support it received from the population, it would be impossible to defeat it. This was also recognized by the police chief of Trine in a letter to his chief in Sophia. The military actions taken in May and June of this year against the illegal communist functionaries, this letter said, have to a certain extent emboldened the population of Trine Oakley. Some inhabitants have begun to show loyalty to the authorities to give the necessary support, believing that this gang will be completely destroyed. Respect for the authorities has begun to be restored. However, the recent appearance of the leaders Slavcho and Dencho within the Okolja again caused anxiety and fear among the population. The respect of the inhabitants for the authorities disappeared, turning entirely to the underground. The returning bandit leaders inspired faith in their adherents. 
the latter began to act with even greater enthusiasm to carry out the plans of the insurgents. In another letter, the police chief know. It has been noticed that all the inhabitants who are members of the Bulgarian Agricultural People's Union have clearly begun to sympathize. This is explained by the fact that not only communists but also representatives of all parties are allowed to join the Patriotic Front. Recently we have come across facts when people who have never held left-wing views are turning to an illegal position. The murders and destructions committed by bandits are commented on by the population in favour of the underground. The population is ready to go over to its side. The police chief goes on to make an even more blatant confession. We feel powerless as the masses are not in favour of us. The reason for this is that our actions are directed against all the JTACs, in fact, against the entire Trin population, with few exceptions. In 1943, the department I headed uncovered several conspiratorial safe houses, and this year not a single one. It is not because we are inactive. We simply do not have the necessary information, and there is nowhere to get it, because the entire population is not with us, but with them. In conclusion, the police chief, signing his own helplessness, asks the higher authority to send as soon as possible and as large a unit of gendarmes as possible, especially for the Tryon district. He declares, I can state with all certainty. If measures are not taken in a timely manner, it will become one of the most dangerous occolias for the authorities, which will subsequently entail great casualties. For all these fears, the police chief had reason. The authorities had completely lost credibility with the population. Their policy, which the partisans had spared no effort to expose, was not receiving any support. Who could not see that the Bulgarian rulers were not serving the people? But Hitler, that the requisitions were carried out in the interests of the German army, that the Tsarist troops were defending the interests not of the people, but of fascist Germany and the Bulgarian capitalists, that the Patriotic Front was the only force that was defending the freedom and independence of the Bulgarian people, and the partisans were its armed fist. Who in Trianokali did not feel the powerlessness of the administration when the headman, obeying our order number 13, immediately submitted their resignations, who did not see how the administrative bodies in the villages carried out the orders of the partisan commanders and not of the Okolia administrator, and who did not notice the continuous consolidation of the authority of the Fatherland Front Committees, which covered more and more villages. What was the result of all this? It was the result of the correct course of the party, which led the Fatherland Front and its armed forces, the guerrilla movement. It was the result of the purposeful work of party and youth leaders, the active actions of partisan detachments and brigades, the victories of the Red Army, which encouraged the fighters for the early liberation of the homeland. In May, when both brigades left Trinska Okolia, changes took place in the life of the city organization. The furious fascists arrested comrades Arsa Rushiv, Toidor Vangelov, Sotir Todorov, Apostol Dazdirikarov, Stoyan Yakimov, Azen Kiatov, Mitko and Basil Dirikarov. Iosif Voskovadziev and others. Some of those arrested were then expelled, others were released from custody. Among the latter was Stoyan Yakimov, Arso Rashev, Apostol Dexirikarov, Todor Vangeliev, and Sotir Todorov. On July 17, all of them, except Yakimov, received summons. They were to report to the Black Company in the village of Boyana near Sofia. This Black Company was a kind of punitive unit to which the fascists sent progressive minded people thus neutralizing them. Upon learning of this, Stoyan Yakimov, a member of the committee, immediately sought out his comrades and warned them not to go to Boyana under any circumstances. At the same time, he met with a contact of the detachment in the vicinity of the town. Unfortunately, the aforementioned comrades did not find the courage to go this time. If to the voice of the party, they packed their belongings and voluntarily went into fascist captivity. Thus, we experienced a second time the disappointment caused by the indecision of those Tirina comrades who preferred to become pathetic toys in the hands of the enemy rather than partisans, fighters for the freedom of the people. After Vlado Trichkov, Georgi and Idanka Chankov went with the 2nd Brigade to Plovdiv. Communication with the district party committee was temporarily interrupted, but when Chankov returned to Sofia, it was immediately restored. With the help of our liaisons Raiko Tukov and Tufil Simov, who maintained contact with the Jatak grandfather Milan from the village of Kisura in Sofia Okolia. There was a constant exchange of both opinions and documents. 
Thus, in early June, shortly after Prime Minister Bozhilov had been replaced by Bagranov, comrades Radenko Vidinsky and Georgi Avramov received a private letter from Sofia, which instructed them to temporarily curtail the partisan struggle and to tolerate Bagrianov's officials. Accordingly, comrades Radenko Vidinsky and Georgi Avramov were to immediately begin disarming and disbanding the partisans. First, the letter fell into the hands of Radenko Vidinsky. After reading it, he even changed his face. Is it possible? Can we lay down our arms now when the struggle has entered a decisive phase? He was indignant. No, it can't be possible. It is impossible that the Central Committee and Georgi Dimitrov thought. So, and Radenko went to the village of Upper Melna, where Bey Pesho was waiting for him. As soon as he entered the room, Radenko handed the letter to Georgi Avramov and, without looking away, watched the expression on his face, which quickly became covered with red spots of anger. This is madness. Mm. Cut off by Pesho. How can we become allies of the wolf? Never. What do you think about it? He turned to Vidinsky. The same as you. Answered Radenko. Then let's write to the district committee. Mo, suggested Georgi Avramov. Tomorrow our liaisons are leaving for Sofia. Let's do it, Radenko agreed. And both party figures immediately got down to business, clearly and unequivocally expressing their disagreement with the opinion expressed in the letter. Having analysed the situation, they pointed out that the assessment of Bagrianov contained in the letter was incorrect, that Bagrianov was a demagogue, that his promises were a complete deception, used to win sympathy, to gain time. They emphasised that the armed struggle of the Bulgarian people should not only not be weakened, but on the contrary, it should be strengthened and given even greater scope. For this was the only way to destroy the fascist regime. As it soon turned out, the members of the district committee analysed the situation in the country and the policy of the bourgeoisie in the same way. They came to the same conclusions as Georgi Avramov and Radenko Vidinsky and hastened to inform them of their point of view. The letter signed by the secretary of the committee, Sir, the government of Bozhilov D. Rostov has been ousted. Its treacherous Germanophile policy has met with the resolute resistance of the Bulgarian people, manifested first of all in the insurgent struggle of the partisan detachments. Their attacks on communities, warehouses, cheese factories, as well as the physical destruction of many German agents and oppressors of the people, created such difficulties for the ruling pro-Hitler gang that it could not cope with them and had to get away. Not considering the deprivations and sacrifices, the most courageous and devoted sons and daughters of our long-suffering people took up arms against this anti-people government, defending the honour, freedom and independence of our motherland. A new government came to power, Agrianovs. The situation, however, has not changed. The Germans remain complete masters in Bulgaria. They hold in their hands our army, gendarmerie and police. The new government of Bagrianov Stanishev Slavako Vasilev, hiding behind the vague rantings of Bagrianov, continues to pursue the old foreign and domestic policy. Our troops are still sent to fraternal Yugoslavia and Greece, where they perform the gendarme functions of executioners and enslavers. Bagrianov's promises remain empty stories, but the deeds of the government he heads expose its bloodthirsty nature. The former police director has been replaced by Lieutenant Colonel Kutsarov, an even greater executioner than his predecessor. That is why no illusions should be entertained about the new government. Nothing good can be expected from it for Bulgaria and the Bulgarian people. It is also an anti-people government, fulfilling all Hitler's wishes, pushing the country towards a colossal national catastrophe. Only the government of the Fatherland Front will save Bulgaria from near ruin. Therefore, the struggle for a truly popular power for the government of the Fatherland Front must be continued with all forces and means. Unita went on to set the following tasks as urgent. The unification and activation of the anti-fascist forces in the country, the even greater activation of the insurgent units in the field, allowing for the temporary dismemberment of the large combat units into smaller ones, which would ensure their greater maneuverability. The continued mobilization and replenishment of the units mainly from among non-party members the creation of active combat groups to carry out sabotage, etc. In the letter, a great deal of emphasis was placed on the army. It stated the following. 
It is necessary to do everything possible to establish contacts with democratically and anti-German-minded officers and non-commissioned officers, to explain to them the role and tasks of the insurgent units, to urge them to cooperate in the common struggle, issue leaflets addressed to officers and soldiers. In these leaflets explain that the guerrillas do not want to fight with the Bulgarian army, but together with it to fight against the Germans, against their domination in our country. It is necessary to instill in the officers and soldiers that by turning their weapons against the partisans, they are helping the Germans, acting in contradiction with the interests of Bulgaria, becoming executioners of their own people in favor of Hitler, and for this they will have to answer to the people who will punish severely but justly every soldier and officer involved in the persecution and killing of Bulgarian, Yugoslav and Greek partisans. We do not wish and will avoid action against the Bulgarian army, but on the army units pursuing the partisans, it is necessary to strike with all the forces and means at our disposal. The members of the party and the home front took with great satisfaction the assessment of the Bagrianov government, given by the district party committee. It was entirely based on the assessment given by the party leader Georgi Dimitrov. On July 27, 1944, our detachment took possession of three villages at once, Berenci, Radovo and Izvor and held them for a whole day. We held village assemblies, dispersed the fascist administration, and established the authority of the home front. Although these villages were only a few kilometers from the town, there was no one who reported us to the police there. The common people cared about us because they loved us, but those who supported the fascist regime feared our retaliation. There was, incidentally, another category of people, representatives of the bourgeoisie, who gradually lost faith in the existing regime and made attempts to get closer to the home front. We have heard of disputes in the bourgeois circles of the city. In these disputes there were open attacks on the regime, which was unable to control the situation and had outlived itself. This was most vividly expressed by the mayor of TRUNIN in a conversation with his friends in Sofia. When asked what was new in the Trianokalia, he replied, What is new is that the Okalia is run by the partisans and we only run the town. The head told the pure truth and however bitter it was for the fascists, they could not change anything. Only this can explain their passivity, even when we provoked them to any active action. After the action in the villages of Berenci, Radovo and Izvor, the detachment, having made a rush, by dawn came to the small village of Jelovica, about fifty houses, situated in a deep hollow. On two sides of it overhung mountains overgrown with oak and beech. In these mountains, skillfully applying themselves to the conditions of the terrain, the partisans of the train detachment camped more than once. Yelovchans treated us well, helped us in every possible way. As soon as we arrived in the village, the local headman by Styko ordered us to eat. We slaughtered piglets and lambs, baked bread. And when the headman was informed that everything was ready, he summoned the villagers for a folk meal. During the meal, representatives of the RMs, the women's organization and the fatherland, front addressed the partisans with greetings. They expressed the willingness of the representatives of the new government to fight with even greater dedication against fascism. Yelovchans have already done a lot for this. For weeks they sheltered wounded guerrillas, fed them, provided them with medicines. Partisan Milka, left to care for the wounded, managed to attract to work not only young people, but also the elderly. Some delivered food, others conducted reconnaissance, others carried guards, others obtained medicines. There was enough to do for everyone. The most active was a guy named Slav. He carried out various errands of the partisan nurse, carried out communication between her and the peasants, was not afraid of either the police or the gendarmes. Georgi Avramov and I responded to the greetings. We told about the present situation, outlined the prospects of our struggle. The villagers listened with great attention to our speeches, which apparently touched their souls, inspired confidence, see the call to the partisans and villagers, to strike a merciless blow against the fascist regime, after which fascism will never recover, was met with a unanimous death to fascism. Toward evening a delegation from the village of Kosturica appeared at headquarters. Stoyan Zakaryev, Grandfather Stoyan Stapoev, Vasil Matov and Miho Zakaryev, on behalf of the local party and Remsist organizations, and the Fatherland Front Committee, insisted that the detachment visit Kosturinsi. The comrades emphasized that their fellow villagers were deeply upset by our rare visits and wanted to know the reason for it. 
Had they offended us in any way, or maybe they had been wronged? Hey, if you neglect the whole village because of a few fascists, he said Stoyan Zakariev, um, tell us so, we will deal with them ourselves. Of course, there were no such reasons, and since the villagers invited us, we decided to fulfill their wish, especially since only two weeks ago, six partisans from Kosturintsev had joined the detachment. As soon as it got dark, the detachment organized in a column and sent out head and side patrols. When we set out, hundreds of men, women and children poured into the square and the surrounding streets. They greeted us with hearty greetings and best wishes. No, come again. The peasants shouted, don't forget us. Only seven kilometers separated Kosturintsi from the Okolian center, where there was a strong police garrison. Despite this, many villagers, disregarding the danger, met us far beyond the outskirts of the village. Boys and girls joined the column, and the partisan song began to sound. Hearing the song, those of the peasants who had been waiting outside their houses now filled the streets. Flowers flew in our direction. In this village the party had a strong support. People remembered with excitement the unparalleled bravery of the people's teacher Georgi Popisaseyev, brutally murdered by bandits in 1925. His sons and grandsons, most of his fellow villagers continued the cause of the revolutionary fighter. The headman in Kosturintsi was Tako Popisayev, the brother of the deceased. Tako Popisayev's son Bozhidar became a partisan. When Tako Popisayev met us, he wept with joy and kissed the partisans who were near him. The day will come, he said, when we will get even for our brother and for all those who died at the hands of the fascists. I am looking forward to that day. At the insistence of the villagers, the command of the detachment came up to the podium. The commander had to make a brief speech. Then the floor was given to a local partisan, Michael Petrov. He spoke about the need for mass participation in the armed struggle, urged young men and women to follow the example of hundreds of partisans fighting throughout the country. The oath that Mikhail Petrov, Bozhidar Tarkov Popisayev, Stoyan Stanoev, Alexander Yanikiev, Boris Gurov, and Evtim Popisayev took in front of their fellow villagers made a deep impression. Then the relatives and friends of the guerrillas from themselves punished them to keep loyalty to the party and the people, to be brave and steadfast in the fight with the enemy. On July 29, at dawn we left Kosturinsi with a song and headed for the Jeloviska Planina Ridge, where we were going to make a day break and then move to the area of Horokitsi, Vid. It had already dawned when the last men of the column entered the thick Jelovica forest. We settled down in a clearing covered with lush green grass. Our comrades were waiting for breakfast, as well as for orders on the order of the coming day. The food was stacked on cloth spread on the ground. I gave one hour for rest. During this time, the political delegates of the branches had to distribute the food and have breakfast. Above the clearing from east to west stretched a high ridge, above which, like camel humps, rose two forested ellipse-shaped heights. To the north of them there was a highway connecting Goroshevsi with Verkhanyaya Melna, from where the enemy could attack. In this connection precautionary measures should have been taken. Georgi Avramov, Dencho and I carefully studied the surrounding terrain, and then sent out a pair of sentries towards the villages of Goroshevsi and Verkhanyaya Melna. Their task was to watch not only the country road, but also the highway roads from trying to Verkhanyaya Melna and trying to Goroshevsi. When we returned from the reconnaissance, we sat down under a thick beech tree to discuss some issues. The sun had already risen above the horizon, but only a few rays managed to penetrate through the dense foliage. A woodpecker was working hard over our heads, and pieces of worm-eaten bark were falling from above. After a sleepless night, it was tempting to lie down to rest, and we would have done it with pleasure, if not for the alarming message of the sentry Granitov and the camp commandant Peter Maladnov that enemy columns were moving from the direction of the villages of Goroshevsi and Elevitsa. It was impossible to delay. It was necessary to take urgent measures, because it was obvious that the enemy decided to suddenly attack us from the northeast. We decided to set up a horseshoe-shaped ambush, with the open side facing where the enemy was expected to come from, and having missed his head guard to open fire when the enemy's main force was inside the horseshoe. I raised the detachment on alarm, ordered a group of men to advance toward the enemy and hold him until we could organize an ambush. The signals for opening fire and going on the attack were determined. The rear was guarded by a squad consisting of Misho Galaviovsky and Gocho Tukovsky. He was assigned the task of preventing a sudden enemy attack 
from the direction of Wolf Glade and the village of Upper Melna. Literally, in a matter of minutes, the fighters scattered to their places and camouflaged themselves. There was a sepulchral silence, as if realizing how important silence was for us, even the birds in the bushes fell silent. Only a woodpecker measured the time with a measured tap. Everyone's eyes were turned to where the enemy was about to appear. Everyone wanted to be the first to spot it and report to the commander. And then a barely perceptible signal came from the left. A quiet cluck of the tongue was quickly passed along the chain, the news that the enemy was approaching. Tension reached its highest point. An officer appeared on the road that cut the ambush exactly in the middle. His epaulets glistened on his shoulders, binoculars hung around his neck. In his right hand he held a machine gun. He looked around with his eyes. Behind him, a few steps away, were two non-commissioned officers in dark green helmets, with carbines in their hands. The lieutenant stopped. As if on command, the non-commissioned officers also froze, staring at the same place where their chief was gazing. The officer's experienced eye noticed something that aroused his suspicion. He signalled his companions to lie down, and he threw his automatic rifle in his left hand, brought his binoculars to his eyes, swung them to the right and left, then froze looking at a bush against which the white duffel bag of one of our soldiers was clearly visible. He caught the lieutenant's glance and could not stand it. As aiding an order, he sent a bullet into the officer. The lieutenant staggered, collapsed on his knees, then sprawled on the ground. Other soldiers also opened fire. Raising clouds of dust, bullets fell thickly near the ditch where the non-commissioned officers had taken refuge. Then Basil Zarkov, with a group of partisans, ran up to that place and reported that the enemy sentry had been neutralized. The main force of the Gendarme unit, realizing how dangerous it was for them to move through the open terrain, did not follow their patrol. Splitting into two groups, they began to circle the height. We immediately reinforced the left flank by sending Dencho and a group of fighters from the Georgi Milev IV. Thus, we now turned our front to the north, towards the forest from where we could expect an enemy attack. However, we were not going to leave the initiative to him. Before he had time to organize, we attacked him and turned him into flight. Some comrades Le Costa, Vasil Zerkov and Boyan Stankov were so carried away by the pursuit that for an hour we had no news from them and already considered them killed or captured. The successful attack encouraged the partisans. Smiles played on their faces. They told each other about their experiences in the battle. Partisans newcomers were especially talkative. With delight recalled, for example, then how he was painfully bumped in the shoulder butt of a rifle when he shot for the first time, and how in front of him in panic retreated five gendarmes. About fifty partisans had gathered on the eastern heights. Violator, the standard bearer, sang Shabdartsev, and the song was taken up by the other fighters. It carried over the forest, spilled over the fields. The reapers working there stopped for a moment, listened and also sang in unison. At that moment, the People's Avengers stormed the enemy positions. A hand-to-hand -hand fight ensued, the enemy could not stand it, and, leaving about a dozen dead and wounded, ran away. You will run at the pass. Peter Meladinov was saying, and Boyan Stankov from Errol was mowing in front of him with a machine gun. On the other flank, in the direction of the Wolf Glade, Densho was leading the battle. Against him acted no less than a company of soldiers and polize who had appeared from the Jelovis forest. Having noticed the approach of enemy soldiers, ours lay low, waiting to see what they would do. The observation was conducted personally by Dencho. Having left them at a short distance, he shouted that they should raise their hands and surrender. The soldiers were confused for a moment, but then, mastering themselves, resorted to stratagem. Two of them lay down with their rifles at the ready, and the others, raising their hands, moved towards Denko, who, deeply pleased at this turn of affairs, thought they were surrendering without a fight, and stood up to meet them. At the same moment, the soldiers who were lying low fired long bursts from their rifles and nearly killed him. Densho threw himself to the ground and fired back. Other soldiers opened fire. Three soldiers collapsed to the ground. The rest panicked and ran back towards the forest. After the attack was successfully repulsed, Depcho came to us. Georgi Avramov and Peter Madinov's couple, who had just returned from the attack, were also there. Observers continued to monitor the enemy, reported the slightest change in the situation. Therefore, we timely learned about the approach of enemy reinforcements and the regrouping which the enemy made. At about four o'clock in the afternoon came a light rain. It became cool. 
the air seemed to soften, it was easier to breathe. Only we discussed with Dencho and George the plan of further actions, as Costa stretched out in front of us with a bloody neck and arm. Ours are retreating, give help. He barely spoke, coughing up blood. I gave Peter Madanoff short orders on the defence of the right flank, and in case of possible retreat, and the three of us ran to the left flank. Behind us, a dozen and a half fighters. There was an unequal battle. The enemy was raining an avalanche of bullets on every inch of land, and our ammunition was running out. True, there were still grenades. By the way, two of our partisans brought a box of captured ammunition. The order was given to prepare grenades and distribute ammunition. A few minutes later, I loudly gave the command. Elijah trumpeted the signal to attack. Violator unfurled the banner. There was a rumble of grenades bursting, machine guns and automatic rifles crackled. A mighty hurrah rang out, and the guerrillas moved after the banner. It did not take us long to retake the nameless heights overgrown with bushes. The enemy was in an extremely disadvantageous position. He had to either flee or surrender. Of course he preferred the first, left the position and turned to flee, but if on this section of the enemy retreated, to the right he was preparing to strike a large force. Hiding behind the trees, the gendarmes were creeping and running closer and closer. They were preparing for a new counterattack. Dencho and Georgi Avamov gathered on the left flank, and I stayed on the right. I lined up near a thick beach to watch the enemy from behind it. But then suddenly I was hit in the chest, my legs gave out, and, having lost consciousness, I fell down. What happened then? I know from the stories of my comrades. The first to notice me was Kosakov. He ran up, opened the medical bag, took out a syringe and ampoules, gave me an injection and, having made sure that my pulse was restored, looked at Densho and Bai Pisho standing in the row, not holding back tears. The two fighting friends kissed me, and ordering me to be carried to the rear, hurried to the place where the onslaught of the gendarmes was particularly strong. The grief aroused in Densho and Bai Pesho a strong thirst for revenge. They did not even want to think of the tenfold superiority of the enemy. They were driven by a single desire, to defeat him at any cost, with one voice they shouted. Comrades, let's avenge the heavy losses. By this time Basil Zarkov and Kalu Mikhailov had been severely wounded, and Bozhan Stankov, a machine gunner, was killed. The soldiers and commanders felt at that moment both grief for their comrades and anxiety caused by the ever-increasing onslaught of the enemy. These two feelings grew into a burning hatred for the killers and the guerrillas. Forgetting the danger to their own lives, driven by the desire for revenge, rushed into a counterattack. Again the hurrah sounded, the fighters came out of the thicket, shooting on the run. They forced the enemy to show his back and drove him far away. Thus, with several successive counterattacks, the Trin partisans secured their success in the battle with 400 Polizian gendarmes, inflicting heavy losses on them. More than 40 corpses were left on the ground. After the immediate danger had been eliminated, it was necessary to make arrangements for the withdrawal of the squad, since nothing guaranteed that the Nazis would not try to attack again. First of all, however, Dencho and Bai Pesho assigned one squad to take care of the wounded and to bury the killed machine gunner Bon Stankov. Before evening, the detachment made a dash to the area of the village of Rani Lug. Here, the detachment leadership conducted a detailed review of the battle and awarded some comrades for their fighting skill and bravery. Among the partisans left with us was Ahari Gurov, Todor Kosirkov and Arizika Takova. After providing us with the necessary assistance, they sheltered us in the forest and went down to Palayula village to take care of transportation. Soon they returned accompanied by the Yateks, Georgi and Ninko Milanov, the boys Milan and Zlatko, and the Stanka. Peter Lazarev, responsible for party political work in the Levorikensky district, also joined the group. Figuring that the traces left by the harness might arouse suspicion, they carried us on blankets to a hollow not far from the village and laid us on a thick layer of dry leaves, well camouflaged and guarded under the care of Kosikov, Milka and our Yatuks. We remained there for two days. But we didn't find Vasco. Later we learned that he, thirsty, had decided to look for water, but had slipped and rolled down into some ravine. He could not walk any more or tried to crawl, but his strength soon left him, and he fell to the dry ground and fell asleep. On the next day, a sanitary team of gendarmes arrived at the place of battle to pick up the dead and wounded. The gendarmes came across Vasco and, seeing his military uniform, took him for their own 
took him together with other wounded and put him in the hospital. Then when they realized that he was a partisan, they wanted to destroy him, but did not have time. The rapid advance of the Red Army, its approach to the borders of Bulgaria, prevented the fascists from realizing their nefarious intention. The Battle of July 29 became a great test for the Tryon detachment. The soldiers and commanders fought selflessly and won, and this victory had a decisive influence on the subsequent development of events in the Okolia. After this battle, the fascists were no longer able to carry out any organized action against the detachment. Carefully looked after us, Comrade Kosirkov, tried to do everything to save us. Our situation with Kana was quite difficult. He was wounded in the kidney area. I was wounded in the chest. My right lung had been punctured, and the bullet, having passed near the aorta, was lodged under the skin of my back. In addition, we were both very exhausted and lost a lot of blood. I regained consciousness on the second day. That's when I realized what had happened to me. The Yataks from Palidula came to the hollow where we were lying, bringing different dishes and offering to eat them. But our appetite was completely gone, and we could hardly breathe. Kayla, tormented by thirst, constantly argued with Milka and Kosirkov that they did not let him drink enough, even accused them that they wanted to kill him. The comrades knew their business well. They explained to him that if he drank water he would surely die, but he did not want to hear it, watching their every move. He took a moment and grabbed the jug and drained it to the bottom. A few minutes later he died. The Yatoks dug a grave and buried him. I was left alone. It was hard without Kala. I was tormented by the thought that he had died before his comrades had used all means to save him, but even more tormented by the fact that Kala, with whom we had been lying side by side all those days, had died before my eyes. On the third day my condition worsened. I had no appetite, I could not sleep. The pains intensified and spread to my shoulder. They were caused by internal hemorrhage, which could not be stopped. The constant danger of being captured by the fascists also affected my well-being. This danger urged our comrades not to stay long in one place. We spent two days in a gully, two more in the bushes near it, then, at the sister of Bai Georgie, after that, at Grandfather Mito's, powerless to cope with the partisans. The gendarmerie decided to take it out on the Yatoks. On July 30, the day after the battle in the Jeloviska Planina area, the gendarmes raided the small mountain village of Kaisel. They went to the house of Boris Ivanov, about whom they had information that he was our Yatak. Right from the doorstep they demanded that they prepare a meal. There is nothing to cook with, Boris replied. Nothing will be born here. What you give to the Sumerians, give to us, ordered the enraged gendarme. Hey, I haven't seen any Shumians, I haven't given them anything, but if you are so hungry, my wife will cook kachamak for you, and we'll eat it too. Hmm, only pigs eat kachamak. Do you think we are like that too? Roared the gendarme. He threatened the master that he would pay dearly for his insolence. Ah, show us the way to Upper Meln. Mel the gendarme said irritably and pushed him roughly. Boris realized that it was pointless to resist and led the gendarmes. However, in Upper Meln he began to insist that he be released. You were in the soldiers, shouted the senior of the gendarmes. Hmm, I was, replied Boris, but now I am not a soldier. Now you are mobilized and will be with us for the rest of your life. The gendarme chief finished sharply. You told me to show you the way to Upper Melna, and I have done so. Now let me go home. The children will be worried, beg, beg Boris. In the evening the gendarmes locked him in the cellar, beat him for a long time, wanted to extract a confession about his ties with the partisans. And in the morning they dragged him with them again, telling him to lead them to the wolf glade. They began to approach the glade. Boris thought that in addition to his will could help to find the partisans, and again began to insist that they let him go. This insistence infuriated the gendarmes, and they dragged him into the thicket, and there shot him. But this was not enough for the monsters. They cut off Boris's arm and stabbed his body with knives. On the same day, alarmed for her husband's fate, Boris's wife set out on the trail of the gendarmes. But on the way she examined the thickets and hollows, looked at almost every bush, but found nothing. Then she went to Goroshevsi, where the gendarmes were quartered. There they refused to tell her anything. Moreover, the gendarmes pretended as if they knew nothing at all. Grieving, the woman returned home. She asked every man she met if he had seen her husband and on the third day the herdsmen told her that they had seen him disfigured in a dell. Tarko Popisayev from the village of Kosturinsi 
was also cruelly dealt with by the gendarmes. A day after Boris's murder, they blockaded the village, arrested all the men, and gathered them in the schoolyard. Standing separately under strict guard was barefoot Tako Popisayev, the village headman. Having beaten the arrested men thoroughly, the gendarmes dispersed them. Only Tako was left, and he faced a different fate. None of the gendarmes, with three yellow stripes on his epaulets, stood in front of him, puffed up like a turkey, and, looking at him fiercely, began interrogating him. Where is your son? With the partisans, answered Tako. Why did you let him go to those bandits? The gendarme became angry. He is an adult. He can judge for himself what is good and what is bad. So you're on their side too, you damned bandit, hissed the enraged gendarme. He struck Tako several times in the face with his fist and then signaled to the escort to lead him on his way to the village of Vukan. When Tako, escorted by the gendarmes, appeared in the street, ten of his children, aged from three to eighteen, rushed crying to their father. Mm, father, take your shoes. You are barefoot, one of them said tearfully. The gendarmes blocked their way and drove them away. Some time later, rifle shots came from a deep hollow beyond the outskirts of the village. A few peasants who were standing in the square at that moment depressed their heads. They drove him away. The... On August 2, the anniversary of the Elishtan uprising, Tako was buried. Although the funeral bell was not rung, the news of the funeral spread throughout the village. Many people gathered. At the coffin, decorated with flowers, stood the sad priest Starman from Leshnikov. He looked around and said excitedly, Hey, it is superfluous to talk about Tako's death. We all know who killed him and why, but the day will come when those responsible will be punished. The priest's words made the villagers even more agitated. Their hatred for the enemies of the people became even hotter. Throwing a handful of earth on Tako's coffin, they quietly saith, Eternal damnation to your murderers. We had information that due to the intensification of the mass partisan movement in Sofia or Kolya, an order had been given from Moscow to airlift Soviet weapons to us. This was to take place on Yugoslav territory, since most of the weapons were intended for the Yugoslav partisans. Therefore, the detachment left our territory and went to the place where the airplanes arrived. Only Georgi Grigorov, the Tsetsa Todorova, and the liaisons Raiko Tokov, Teofimov, and Zachary Gurov remained. The latter carried out communication between me, Georgi Avramov, who had left with the detachment, and Dencho, while the other two liaisons carried out communication between the party and military leadership in Trina Okolia and the district party committee. With the help of our liaisons, we kept each other informed of both combat and political activities. It happened, however, that because of the increased activity of the enemy, or because of the great distances involved, communication was disrupted. Then we resorted to the help of Yotex. Nenko Milanov from Palilula went to Sofia several times to deliver letters for the district party committee through Alexander Peshev, and to bring medicines that we could not get in Trime. By this time, the situation in Sofia had already stabilized. Most of the members of the district committee were in their places. By and large, the work went on normally. Communication with all the Okolian party organizations was restored. The detachments and brigades operating in the region, although they had suffered considerable losses, not only did not weaken their blows, but were even bolder in their attacks on the Tsarist army, police and gendarmerie, which had begun to disintegrate. From the battles which in many cases were fought at the initiative of the insurgents, the latter emerged even more hardened, enriched with experience, and even more adapted to the struggle with the enemy. Now even the youngest fighters, even those who had not gone through military service, have mastered guerrilla tactics, skillfully used personal weapons. Such was the state of affairs in the last month before the victory. A few days after I was moved to Maito's grandfather, I learned that Kristen Kristanov had also been wounded. At first, both Kosakov and Milka kept away from. They did not want to worry me, you see. However, I noticed that Kosakov often went somewhere, changing into a woman's dress so that the reapers did not recognize him, and was absent for two or three hours. At last, he was forced to tell where he went, and then, at my insistence, Kristen was brought to us. He was wounded in the shoulder by our own partisan, who had begun to disassemble a loaded pistol. Kristen's condition was also difficult, but when we were alone together, we felt better. And then Sitiatsa Todorova arrived. She and Milka took care of food, linen, medicines, and were on duty at night. 
Stoyan Ilia from the town of Sviti Vrak and Meta Dijie from the village of Dolna Dikanja, Radomir Okolia, carried the outside guard, Radomir region, armed with automatic rifles. They were on duty around the clock. Kasirkov, our doctor, was an active man. During the day he took care of us, and in the evening, as soon as it got dark, he would go on actions. When we met Kristen and my condition improved a little, Kosikov said. Then, I have information that traders have come to Lower Melna, as if they were buying cattle for some German firm. May I check what kind of people they are? I'll allow it. He took some guys from the Palilula fighting group with him, went to those traders, and when it turned out that they were engaged in supplying the German army, he took away their money and drove them out of the village. The next day the police raided Palilula and seized by Georgie Mistakler and Basil Ignatov. They were taken to Tryon, where they were subjected to cruel tortures. However, both our Yutuks stood firm and did not report anything about us to the Polizei. Nevertheless, we found it expedient to leave Verkanyaya Melna and move to Leshnikopsi, about eight kilometers from our former camp. If Slavka, Grandfather Mito's sister-in-law, and Grandfather Mito himself trembled over us, took care that we had everything we needed, and kept guard, we did not feel very well at the home of Bay George's sister, Alexia. The difference between sister and brother was like between heaven and earth. She was not only afraid of everything, but also hid butter, milk, eggs, the very products that are primarily needed by the sick. And we paid her. We didn't want to get anything for nothing. Even Strati, the blacksmith, was more humane than her. He gave flour, butter and other products and never said a word about payment. Uncle Strati had already realised that he should not go against the tide, though he had never been our enemy. There was a great difference between the Uncle Strati we knew at the beginning of the struggle and the present one. We thought long and hard about how to get from Upper Melna to Leshnikowis. The most convenient, of course, is by cart, but it is also the most dangerous because we have to take the road, and it runs through inhabited places and we can be detected by the enemy. It's risky on horseback, but it was difficult for someone like me, who could hardly stand on his feet. Still, we decided on horseback. We found a meek one, fed it well, saddled it, and set. The weather was good. A starry August night, clear and cool. The moon shone brightly, the leaves rustled quietly. There were seven in our group. One of the comrades who guarded us walked in front, another, behind, and Kosakov, Kristanov, Milka, Sietza, and I held together. They supported me because my head was spinning and I was losing my balance every now and then. We made only one rest stop along the way, but I didn't feel very tired, which was a happy sign. Kristen was walking on his own. His condition allowed it. There were still two or three kilometres to the house of Zakarina Nikolova, where we were going. In the meadows and fields through which the road led, the earth was cracked from the long drought. It longed for rain, but there was not a cloud in the sky. From time to time they appeared, light and white, but quickly disappeared. Here at last was Aunt Zakarina's house. Besides her, there lived here the teacher Dimitar Stoyadinov, a Democrat, at whom we left our things for safekeeping, his brother, our old friend Grandfather Stapko, and several other families. All friends of the partisans, Mahala was sleeping a deep sleep. Neither human voices nor barking dogs were heard. The silence was broken only by the stomping of the horse, which from time to time struck a stone with its hoof, and by its snorting if any dust or not touched its sensitive nostrils. Auntie Zakharina had not locked the gate, but it must not have been oiled for a long time. The hinges creaked, and a big black dog came barking at us. Milka threw a piece of bread, and the dog was silent, looking for a handout on the ground. At that time, the doctor knocked on the door. No one answered. He repeated it. Then an angry female voice answered, Ooh, who's there in the middle of the night, banging on the door, scaring my children? My partisans, auntie, replied the doctor. Slavcho is with us. I don't know any Slavcho, shouted the woman even louder. Sitting on my horse, I listened to their conversation. Our Jatoks were not so simple. They knew that the enemy likes all kinds of provocations. That's why we sometimes had to stand under the door until the owners were convinced that we were partisans and not police. Answer the Karina would not unlock the door, saying that she knew no one, and that at such a time as this she would not open the door to anyone, not even to the heir to the throne. Mm. Come here, said Kosikov to me. Perhaps you will be able to persuade her. I got off my horse, went to the door, 
and as soon as I reminded her of the excellent mamaliga she had treated me to on my last visit, Aunt Zakarina immediately unlocked it. Why didn't you say so at once? She reproached me, but noticing how pale I was, she took me under her arm and led me to the children's room. The room was unusually large, with two windows, between which stood a row of wooden beds. The noise we made woke the children. Five or six dishevelled heads peeped out from under the motley blankets. The eldest of the daughters was about twenty, and the youngest about four years old. Aunt Zakarina told them to go into the other room, and she herself began to make the beds. As her husband was in Sofia, all the men's housework was left entirely to Grandfather Peter, her old father-in-law. Grandfather Peter was a naturally intelligent man, with a wealth of life experience. Both Auntie Zakarina and Grandfather Peter were good at everything. They got along well and helped each other in conspiratorial work. She never missed a chance to consult with him, but he, for his part, did nothing without knowing her opinion. As a matter of fact, we had not known them very well before. We stayed with them two or three times, but they were not members of our party and did not know anything about politics. Neither were their eldest daughters in the youth organization. We were united by the same understanding of economic issues and the desire to free ourselves from the yoke of the fascists as soon as possible. Auntie Zakarina and Grandfather Peter risked themselves and their whole family for this purpose. They made a lot of efforts to cure us as soon as possible. Our stay in their house did not remain a secret. Even though we warned Aunt Zakarina, she could not bear it and told everything to her daughter, who was married to the son of the village priest, to her grandfather Stanko, to Dimitar Stoyadinov and others. It was both bad and good. Bad because the secret passed from mouth to mouth and could reach the ears of the enemy. The good thing was that everyone who knew about us was watching if the Polizi were approaching and notified us in time. One day the Polizi appeared from the direction of the village of Yalopsi. An alarm went up in the Mahala. Auntie Zakarina's children and even the old men, Grandfather Peter and Grandfather Stanko, were shouting in broken voice. As eyes are coming, they will catch you now. Aunt Zakarina was the calmest of all. Slava, my son, she said to me, go up to the attic. They're not likely to look for you there. Yatachka put a ladder against the wall and herself hurried into the courtyard to follow the policeman. With the help of Kozakov, Milka and Tisetsi, I got out of bed and slowly, step by step, climbed up to the attic. I was followed by the rest of my comrades with weapons, while the two partisans who had been guarding us took refuge in the hazel thicket not far from the house. Crouching under the low roof, we heard Aunt Zakarina saying to her children, Let's run away from here. Stay away and don't you dare say that we are partisans. Otherwise those blood-sucking policemen will burn us. You haven't seen anything, you haven't heard anything, so answer. After a while, the dogs raised a deafening bark. The polizai were approaching. Auntie Zakarina watched through the window and told her, Here they are coming into the yard. Not many of them. I'll go out to meet them. Then a noise came from the yard, someone shouting, Hey, is anyone in the house? They froze in full alert, automatic rifles, on alert muscles tense, hearts beating fast. How it would go on, whether Aunt Zakarina would be able to deceive the enemy, that worried all of us. Among other things, we were counting on our guards, whose task was to immediately strike the enemy from the rear if there was a firefight in the house. Do you have any Shumians? I heard the husky voice of a policeman. Not only have I not seen any, but I don't know where they are. Aunt Zakarina answered confidently but somewhat tearfully. Well, I haven't. Not one of you has ever said that you have seen them. You don't see them, you don't feed them, but they live. Every single one of you is lying. If you lie, God will kill you. Well, 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 said the policeman ironically. You will swallow a cross to prove that you have not seen forest bandits. If you don't believe me, go and check, Aunt Zakarina suggested in a resentful tone. If they were here, you wouldn't have the guts to invite us. Hmm. Another policeman intervened and hurried his partners. It's time to go on. Thank God, Milka sighed. And this time we survived. Now thank Auntie Zakarina, you said Kasakov. If she had been afraid, neither God nor the Holy Mother of God would have helped you when the danger was over. Aunt Zakarina brought a ladder hidden under the ladder, and we descended from the attic. Good girl. Kristen praised her. Now you are a certified Yotaka. She laughed in full voice. 
For her it was not only a test, but also a feat. Three or four days later my condition worsened. Not only was I wounded, but I was also stricken with malaria. It was accompanied by high fever. A day later I was shaking. Again I lost my appetite. I was rapidly losing strength. I was not only could I walk, I couldn't stand. At first Kosirkov was frightened. It was difficult to understand the cause of the sudden rise in temperature. But when I began to shake, then he made a diagnosis, wrote a prescription, and sent Aunt Zakharina to the city with it. As the malaria was detected in time and the necessary measures were taken, I was again on the mend. Kristan also recovered, and together with Kozakov they plotted an action against a well-known enemy of the people in the village. This action was at the same time the end of our stay in Leshnikopsi. We had already stayed here too long, and it was time to move to a new place. Besides, too many people in the neighborhood now knew that wounded partisans were hiding somewhere nearby. We moved to Uncle Kolo's place in Bisinti. It was early in September when Bagrianov resigned and was replaced by Muraviev, an even more masterful demagogue, who had been instructed by the bourgeoisie to declare neutrality. In reality, he not only did not observe neutrality, but secretly from the people tried to harness the country into the chariot of Anglo-American imperialism, did everything possible to have the German army withdrawn from Bulgaria instead of being disarmed and neutralized on the spot, As events were unfolding rapidly. The Red Army came to our border, the people were preparing for a decisive blow, and our detachment kept lingering on Yugoslav territory. Of course, this was not good. At such a moment, the detachment should have been in the home of in Bizichai, we were left with Kosakov alone. Kristan, Milka and Siko went to Irul to contact Georgi Grigorov, after which Kristen was to return to his Okalia. He had already fully recovered. In connection with the rapidly developing events, on August 5, a meeting of the responsible representatives of the party in Radomir, Trine Bresnik and Sofia Okali was held on the top of Kristen, near the village of Erul. Present were Georgi Avramov, Georgi Grigorov, Dencho Gorov, Slavcho Radomirsky, Svilen Veselinov and Kristan Kristanov. The meeting was conducted by a representative of the Sofia District Committee of the Party and the Fatherland Front. The main issue at the meeting was the armament of the Sofia Party organization, Shoppa and Seri Broad detachments. This indicated that the preparation of a decisive blow against the fascist government was in full swing and that it was now a matter of arming. Although we ourselves felt a certain lack of weapons, since new fighters were continually being added to the detachment, it was nevertheless decided to allocate some and send the weapons to Sofia. The second thing discussed was the establishment of a free territory. We could no longer roam from village to village, from one mountain range to another. We needed our own territory on which we would establish the authority of the Fatherland Front and defend it with all our strength and means. The third question put up for discussion was our policy towards the Tsarist army, whose decay was deepening day by day. Without the defeat of the army as a tool of the fascist dictatorship, it is impossible to quickly seize power. At the end of the meeting, a comrade from the district committee reported the changes which the party had made in the leadership of the zone. I was appointed commander, Georgi Avramov was appointed commissar, and Densho became the chief instructor in the combat activity of all the units of the zone. During the meeting we received news from Yugoslavia that weapons were expected to arrive. Because of this, the detachment had to immediately leave the territory of Trina and go to the village of Petrov Gora in Vranjka Okulia, where the detachment fighters met with our Georgi Dimitrov Brigade, which had already arrived in the area under the command of Atanas Rusov and Kiri Ignatov. The formation of the Georgi Dimitrov Brigade became known to the District Party Committee, and it decided to take all measures to strengthen it. The chief of staff of the zone, Zdravko Georgiev, who arrived in mid-August in the village of Krivolivada, Vranskoy Okolya, was entrusted to take care of it on the spot. Comrades Cairo Ignatov, Etanas Rusev Georgi Avramov, Depcho Durov Kirill Bogoslavsky, Viljo Vanev, Boris Tashev, Slavcho Venev and Ivan Marinov were there. They took part in a meeting which discussed the moral and political condition of the brigade and decided to immediately replenish it with about 50 experienced partisans from the Tryan and Bosley Grad detachments. These included Slavsho Venjev, Sasho Barilev, Marko Behar, Zlatko Yanakiev, Nikola Taskov, Peter Meladinov, Ivan Yanakiev, Zinovije Zinovijev and others.
Thus the brigade grew to 300 men and became a fully combat-ready unit, in view of which, given the request of the Yugoslav leaders, it was transferred to Macedonia. Although Baipesho and Dencho were quite far away from me, we found ways to coordinate almost all the most important issues concerning our political and military activities. Thus, in a letter sent in late August or very early September, Baipesho informed me of the appointment of the new leadership of the trainer detachment and of the refusal of the English mission to deliver weapons to us. This refusal the English officers motivated by the fact that their government looked upon the Muraviev cabinet as a force capable of driving the Germans out of Bulgaria and giving the Bulgarian people freedom and independence. And in fact, wrote Bey Pesho, the government of Muraviev is not to the taste of the Bulgarian people, but of the English bourgeoisie, which expects it to subordinate Bulgaria to the will of Churchill. In the same letter, Baipesho reported that in just two days 70 to 80 soldiers had joined the detachment and that the 25th Regiment was preparing to join the partisans in full. We explained the change in the mood of the army by the new task of taking over the fight against the partisans, which, in the opinion of most of the soldiers and officers, the army may not be able to do. They correctly understood the situation, and the only reasonable way out was to join the side of the people, which would preserve their honour and would not violate their loyalty to their fatherland. In August, the party published two important documents. Circular No, four of the Central Committee, and an article by Georgi Dimitrov. The circular was addressed to the leadership, organisations and members of the Workers' Party. It stated that Bulgaria was experiencing historic days, that a decisive hour had struck for her, that her fate depended solely on the people and the patriotic strata of the army. A further stay in power, at least for another day, by force imposed on the people by the regents and the pro-German government of Bagranov, the continuation in any form of alliance with the Germans means the defeat and ruin of our motherland. Before the party, the home front, before the entire Bulgarian people and the army, the task was set with all categorical determination to rise up for a courageous and decisive struggle for the immediate breaking of the alliance with Hitler's Germany and the expulsion of the Germans from Bulgaria. The circular emphasised the necessity of the immediate withdrawal of the occupation corps from Yugoslavia and Greece, the establishment of mutual understanding with fraternal Yugoslavia and joint action against the German enslavers, the immediate release of all patriots and the abolition of emergency laws. The directives of the Central Committee of the BKP were summarised as follows. Everywhere, with the involvement of all the forces of the party, the Rams, the Patriotic Front, the broad working masses, patriotic soldiers and officers, to unfold a nationwide struggle and insurgency movement against the Germans and their Bulgarian agents, to hold meetings, rallies and demonstrations, to raise workers, railway workers, civil servants to political strikes, to organise a general political strike to provide armed support for all these actions. All insurgent forces, cheetahs, battalions, brigades were days to undertake bold and systematic actions everywhere. A. To attract the army to the side of the struggling Bulgarian people, coordinating with it joint actions against the Germans and German agents for the salvation of Bulgaria. To the patriotic front to urge the people and the army to a brave armed struggle. As emphasised in the circular, only the home front government represents truly popular democratic power. In solving all the above tasks, the party leaders and every party member must show exceptional firmness, determination, initiative and a sense of responsibility. In conclusion, the party called for bold and daily action, for a resolute struggle for a free, independent and democratic Bulgaria. In the conditions of the approaching final defeat of Hitler's Germany, in the conditions now created in the Balkans, Georgi Dimitrov pointed out, the Bulgarian people, its partisan movement and patriotic militia in cooperation with the People's Liberation Army of Yugoslavia, the Macedonian and Greek insurgents are quite capable of immediately breaking the brigandish alliance with Hitler's Germany and expelling the Germans from the confines of their country. Dimitrov's circular and article gave an answer to all the questions that worried the Bulgarian people raised the question of an uprising of taking power. The workers of the party, the MRMs, the Fatherland Front made every effort to prepare the last decisive battle with fascism. The uprising felt closer, more real than ever. It was calling, mobilising the forces of the party, the RMs and the Fatherland Front, calling the entire nation to the final assault on the fascist fortress, 
the mastery of which was no longer very difficult. The revolutionary pulse became even stronger. The faith in the triumph of our ideas shone even brighter. Only a few of the 52 villages in Okoli still had no party, youth cells or organizations of the Fatherland Front. The local organizations of the BKP had an average of six to eight men. The youth organizations were larger. The smallest were the organizations of the Fatherland Front, usually three, five people each. Militant groups were active in many villages. Most of them had their own weapons. They carried out the orders of the detachment. In the first days of September, the Trinsky detachment was in the area of the villages of Kalna and Krivia Jabuka. The comrades learned that a group of Bulgarian officers, transferred by airplanes from Moscow, were looking for communications. This pleased the detachment command, and Bai Pesho was the first to express his desire to meet them and escort them to the detachment, taking with him a soldier for protection. He set out on the road with youthful enthusiasm, the same enthusiasm with which he undertook any task assigned to him, from the smallest to the largest. Bai Pesho sensed that the decisive hour was approaching. He devoted all his energies to bringing that hour nearer as quickly as possible. This explained the impulse with which he went to meet his comrades from Moscow. He wanted to fly over Viatop to give space to his heart, which for a long series of years, starting from the school bench, then during the years of study at the university, in prison and concentration camp, had been beating for the sake of that day, that hour when from a high rostrum it would be possible to say, Hello, free people, fascism has been defeated. But in this joyful flight, by Pesho was ambushed. The vicious enemy aimed deadly fire at him. The proud heart of the revolutionary, which had never known fatigue before, stopped beating, and the youthful enthusiasm that had always shone in his eyes faded away. Thus died by Pesho on the very threshold of freedom. All day long his comrades did not know of his fate. They imagined him embracing the old revolutionaries who had been forced to leave their homeland many years ago, as he spoke fervently of the near victory, and in their hearts they envied his happiness. And suddenly this overwhelming news of Bai Penyu's death. Lightning spread from fighter to fighter, from village to village. How much everyone wished that the cobbler from Kalni who brought this news had turned out to be a liar. Comrades from Moscow waited for a long time in one of the houses in the village of Dobropol. Although they knew about everything that was happening to the smallest detail, they were worried that our representative did not appear. Having gone through the fire of the September uprising of 1923, after its defeat they found refuge in the great Soviet country, and there, thousands of kilometers away from their homeland, the fire of the struggle for the freedom of the people of labor continued to burn in their hearts. And when they worked, and when they learned to read and write, and when they participated in the struggle of the Russian workers and peasants against speculators and swindlers, and when together with their Soviet friends they built new cities, created new industry and new life, and when they argued about the ideological positions of the Bulgarian Communist Party, they learned, grew and matured for the motherland. Some of these humble people sneaked more than once through the borders of Bulgaria, strictly guarded by the fascists, forgetting the danger to their lives under false names they travelled along the roads of our country, through its towns and villages, in the name of keeping alive the spirit of September, in order to dispel the impenetrable night that had descended on Bulgaria. But not everyone was able to do this, and it did not depend only on their desire. The sudden attack of Hitler's Germany on the peaceful Soviet country further united the ranks of the Bulgarian political immigrants. They began feverish preparations to move to Bulgaria. Some succeeded in accomplishing this, while others fell into the clutches of the enemy and perished. These Bulgarians, who carried us the rich experience of building the world's first socialist power, so useful to us both in the illegal struggle and after the victory, had only a few hours left before they would set foot on their native land and meet their compatriots. So one can well understand their impatience. At last it came to pass. In the small courtyard of a poor peasant in the village of Dobropol, a touching meeting took place. Under the pseudonyms of the Moscow comrades hid the popular names of the old revolutionaries Sheta Yoatanasov, Ivan Vinerov, Dmitry Gilin, Ilya Deniv and Petko Katsarov. With them was D. Dishev, the political commissar of the 12th zone, who was coming to us for weapons. The Moscovites did not arrive alone. Together with them moved a long-formed soldier battalion. Under the command of Boyan Miknev, it had overcome hundreds of kilometers with battles. In the luggage of the Muscovitz, a walkie-talkie was making noise. 
to the leader of the party, Georgi Dimitrov, who was constantly aware of our affairs. It transmitted to Moscow our long-standing request. Esma said Dupin's comrade Dimitrov. We need arms. Send it as soon as possible with the Soviet Falcons. And not much time passed. The airplanes began to buzz over Dobro Pole. They made a few circles, and then dozens of parachutes opened over the forest. That's Moscow. That's Soviet equipment, said the partisans, recalling at the same time our British and American allies, who under various pretexts delayed the delivery of weapons. Friends are known in trouble, Mel said an old partisan. He shouted in a full voice, Long live brothers, long live the Red Army. With great excitement, people unpacked and distributed weapons. There was so much of it that they armed about 10,000 Bulgarian and Yugoslav partisans and still left in reserve. The days before the uprising passed under the sign of preparation for the decisive blow, which was called for by the manifesto of the National Committee of the Home Front, drafted briefly and with the utmost clarity. In it, the Fatherland Front called for a bold and energetic struggle for the liquidation of the anti-people regime, for the government of the Fatherland Front, for the realization of the aspirations and urgent needs of the people. The manifesto contained lines addressed to officers, non-commissioned officers and soldiers. The views of the entire Bulgarian people are addressed to you, the manifesto said. In a difficult hour for the fatherland, fulfill your duty as true sons of the people. Join the people's liberation struggle and together with the people's fighters win freedom for our dear homeland. Without doing so, you will destroy the future of the native army and your own future together with the future of Bulgaria. The manifesto of the National Committee of the Fatherland Front to the Bulgarian people represented a program of action, both during the uprising and after it. The provisions contained in the 16 paragraphs of the document were fully realizable in the conditions of a deployed and powerful partisan movement and the presence of the Red Army, the liberator on our northeastern border. They were realizable provided that the Bulgarian army of many thousands turned its bayonets against the monarchy in defense of the national independence of Bulgaria. Many patriots who were in the Tsarist army realized the greatness of the moment in which the fate of the fatherland was being decided forever and came over to the site of the people's liberation forces. Thus, on August 27, Lieutenant Gino Jovev came over to our side along with 60 soldiers. They tore off the Assar's coat of arms from their pilots and put on the emblem of the Fatherland Front. Zedro Georgiev was with us during these tense days. In accordance with the instructions of the Central Committee of the Party and Georgi Dimitrov, he urged the question of the immediate creation of a partisan division. This was done when comrades Satanasov, Vinarov and Dishev arrived, and Soviet weapons served as the material basis for the realization of this decision. The first partisan division consisted of the partisans of the Trinsky, Radomir and Bresnik detachments, Miknu soldier battalion and Gino Jovev's company. Although I was absent at the time, my comrades found it expedient to entrust me with the command of the division and appointed Zdravko Georgiev as its commissar, Densho as my deputy in the field, and Boris Tashiev as deputy political commissar. The division consisted of three brigades. The first brigade was entrusted to Denko and Dimitar Gilin, the second to Boyan Miknev and Ilya Deniv, and the third to Evtim Rangelov and Petko Katsarov. The personnel of the division was so well equipped and armed that it could not be compared to the large Theret's divisions. It represented a serious force and a solid support for the workers not only of the Trinska, Bresnik, Radomir, Saribrod and Bosiligrad districts, but also of the emerging government of the Home Front. One after another, several military units came over to our side. Thus, the number of soldiers and commanders of the division increased to about 2,000. Events were approaching their logical end. The Red Army stood on our northeastern border, ready at any moment to cross the furrow of exclusion, years in a row deepened by the Romanian and Bulgarian fascists. Millions of eyes in Bulgaria were turned to the northeast and eagerly awaited the moment when they could see and meet the Soviet soldiers' liberators, about whose heroic deeds people learned from the broadcasts of forbidden stations and materials of our illegal press. Involuntarily came to mind memories of the old Bulgarian-Russian friendship, born in the battles of the liberating Russian-Turkish war, and cemented in the most difficult days of the October Revolution, when the Bulgarians not only did not oppose the young Soviet power, but gathered grain by grain to help food to the distressed Russian people. The Bulgarian people with a clear conscience expected a meeting with the sons of the Soviet peoples. 
It did not dance to the tune of Hitler's local servants, and despite numerous attempts to embitter it against the Soviet country, not a single Bulgarian soldier went to the Eastern Front. We did not fire a single shell or a single bullet at our Soviet brothers. The traditional Bulgarian-Russian friendship was protected by our people as a shrine. Throughout this brutal war, the Bulgarian working class followed the development of events with bated breath. At difficult moments for the Soviet people, and we breathed hard, every victory of the Red Army was a true holiday for the Bulgarian toilers. When the Soviet government made an appeal to the Soviet peoples, when it gave orders to its armed forces, we felt that it concerned us as well. Therefore, when Moscow Radio reported that the Red Army was awaiting the response of the Muraviev government as to its future course, Bulgarians from mountains and fields, factories and plants, from the deep mines, cried out impatiently, Soviet brothers, come to us as soon as possible. This spontaneous impulse, which covered the whole country, could not fail to reach millions of Soviet soldiers who crushed fascism. On September 7, in the village of Jalovica, the last illegal meeting of the Trianokoli Committee of the Fatherland Front took place. It was held under the sign of the people's demand to take power, which was to be realized according to a plan that would correctly distribute the available forces and means. First of all, it was necessary to put the local organizations of the party, the RMs, the Patriotic Front, the Farmers' Union and other anti-fascist parties on full alert to explain to the population that the Soviet country was at war with Bulgaria through the fault of the government of Muraviev. The last puppet of the bourgeoisie, that the Red Army was ready to help us free ourselves from the fascist yoke, that the Bulgarian people should rise up in a general armed uprising. September 9 was set as the day of the uprising. On that day, on the signal of the home front, it was necessary to seize power in all villages and communities of the Okolia, occupy military barracks and disarm the police. The main forces of the uprising were located in the area of Kalna, Jabukovic, Kravina Jabuka. After receiving the order, they were to appear in Trina Okolja. The police found out about the meeting in Jelovica. They also learned of other things, but took no action. Now the police officials were only concerned with one thing, how to save their own skin. And the partisan division, like a hammer, was looming over the heads of the fascists, and the Red Army was approaching Sofia. The great daredevils and brave men who had killed hundreds of defenseless people were now looking for any crevice to escape from the colony to avoid popular retribution. The executioners were greatly disturbed by the strike of the Pernik miners. It covered all the mines and mines. The miners were the first to express their distrust of the fascist government and, leaving their workplaces, took to the streets to protest against the Bulgarian bourgeois policy of robbery and oppression. The strike of the Pernik miners served as a signal for a widespread seizure of power for the elimination of the domination of the bourgeoisie. During September 8 and 9, the murderers of many partisans and Yatarks fled from trying Lieutenant Colonel Mapov, Lieutenant Colonel Stoyshev, the burned demagogue Nikola Vasilev, the police inspector Angelov. In the city remained only those of the regime's adherents who understood perfectly well. No matter how you hide, you can't hide anywhere. On the morning of September 9, six partisans, including Raicho Tukov, Mitko Granitov and Kosta Novoselsky, gathered in the village of Palayula. They heard that the partisans had occupied the town and immediately decided to go to Strezimirutsi, where, according to their information, a military unit wanted to surrender. They stopped a passing truck and went straight to Strezimropsi. Granitov alone entered the lieutenant colonel's office. The others guarded the doors. Granitov said hello to the lieutenant colonel and briefed him on the terms of surrendering the unit. At first, the lieutenant colonel was frightened, but noticing Granitov's excitement, he calmed down and said that he would not surrender his weapons to anyone without an order from above. The comrades were satisfied with this and went to the city. They believed that there, at least the enemy had been brought into submission and the people's power established. When they arrived in the town, however, it was discovered that, except for them, no other guerrillas were here. The guards were not civilians, but police officers, and in general the usual routine was not disturbed in any way. It turns out that the rumours that have reached us are not true, thought the comrades. They'd unlike the Stresimiropsi, they did something different. They immediately sought out several figures of the Fatherland Front, together with them came to the Okolai administration 
disarmed the polizei, gathered them in the courtyard under guard, and forbade the Oakley administrator and the chief of police to move about the town without permission. After the seizure of power, the comrades immediately sent trucks through the villages, on which the older and younger people began to flock to the town. In the afternoon of September 9, a passenger car was moving towards the village of Byzantsi. Bouncing and bouncing on the bumps, it slowly entered a small square, crossed it, turned right into a narrow alley that turned into a road to the village of Yukon. Uncle Colo, who did not know the course of events, followed the car anxiously, and, when it stopped at his gate, called out to us, excited, Guys, get ready. It seems that you have been discovered. Uncle Colo was still all in the anxious tension of the illegal struggle, and thought that the enemy had arrived in connection with the action we had carried out in the village the night before. Kasirkov glanced at me and winked. Uncle Colo's display of vigilance made him laugh. He knocked down his junker's cap, the red colour of which harmonised so well with his swarthy face, and shout. Don't be afraid, Uncle Colo. They are ours. With these words he rushed toward the door. Across the yard hurried Dencho, Zygdravko, Stoyan Yakimov, and my father. We met at the door. We didn't have the patience to wait in the room. Hey, Dencho, where did you disappear to? Why didn't you give any news about yourself? Shouted Kozakov, hugging Dencho. Yes, I haven't disappeared, Tosho. You see, I'm travelling in a car. At that moment I was dragged to the door. Densho, seeing me, broke out of Kozakov's embrace, rushed to me. Behind him, my father. Look, Slava recovered. Densho said, opening his long arms, in one of which he held a brand new Soviet automatic rifle. Do you see, Slava, what our brothers have given us? He shouted at the top of his voice. I see, Densho. I see. The brothers gave us not only weapons. They helped us to free ourselves from fascist slavery. Both of them, Densho and my father, embraced me. Our hands intertwined. Eh, May, what are you doing? You'll strangle him, Zidrukko said, approaching us. We kissed him. Dencho laughed happily. His face shone with happiness. But my father cried. I could not restrain myself, especially since neither he nor my mother had seen me since I was wounded. I deliberately rejected their request to see me, because I assumed that after Dencho in the village of Ranalug, the day after the battle in the vicinity of Jilovica, the police would certainly track down my relatives to try to trace me. I knew it was hard for them, but I also knew that I should not take any chances. I was sure the day would come when I would see you again. And that day came. We had very limited time. We had to hurry. The division lined up in the village of Miloslavsi was waiting for me to receive it. The officers who had arrived from the Soviet Union were also there. We were to enter Trine before dusk, and in the following days, as of it, having parted with Uncle Kolo's family, we left. The day was sunny. There was neither the usual fog for this time of year, nor the penetrating air currents that sometimes rush through the valley of the Irma River. This beautiful weather involuntarily led to the thought that nature was for us, and she was as if rejoicing at the successful outcome of our struggle. On the way to Miloslavsi, the whole life of the detachment, from a small action on the Slizo Barrow to a major battle in the mountains near Jilovica, passed in my memory like a movie frame. In my mind, I went back to November 1942, when I dreamed of seeing a large partisan unit, a dense network of yataks and the flame of revolutionary struggle that had burst out all over our land. Two years have passed since then. During this time, the detachment grew, giving rise to two brigades and then a division. What could be more joyful than this? Our People's Liberation Army was taking power throughout the country, the hour of fascism had passed, an independent and strong Bulgaria was being born, and in all this our Trinsky unit had a modest contribution. But along with these pleasant thoughts swarmed the memories of the heavy losses suffered by our people fighters. Here we are passing near the village of Turokivsi. Recently here one of our group had an unequal fight with the police. Jonah Petrov and Raiko Nestorov were killed, we go further, turn off the main highway and enter the Miloslav or valley. Billowed grass on meadows and falling leaves bring sadness at memory of five partisans and yataks shot by gendarmes. We are approaching the village. Against the background of the autumn colourful mountains, we can see long slender rows of the division. My soul trembles with impatient expectation of meeting after a long separation from friends and relatives. I imagine my mother's eyes full of tears of happiness and at the same time in the centre of all this joyful picture, 
appears before me the image of Stro, deputy political commissar of the detachment, killed in this village. The car stopped in front of the right flank of the division. Here stand the old revolutionaries, experienced and devoted fighters of the party. Vinarov, Dichev, Atanasov, Gilin E. All those who for many years knew nothing about the fate of their families, who lived many thousands of kilometers away from them, are fighters for whom the cause of the party is above all. The powerful voice of the tall and slender Dimitar Gilin was heard. He gave the command attention, then, on guard and with a springy, chiseled step, went to us with a report. At the same moment, hundreds of serious and loving eyes stared at me, waiting for something and talking about the victory of the people. Gillen's report was brief and confident, more confident, I think, and could not have been more confident. The ceremony did not take long. The few words for which I had summoned all my strength ended with a long hurrah, and then began the inimitable fun. Toward evening the division marched to Trine. Entire villages came out to meet us with joyful songs and flowers. Thousands of young men and girls, men, women and children greeted the soldiers and joined the column which from village to village became longer and longer, and when its head had already reached the city, its tail was still wagging somewhere in the fields. The entry into the city was solemn. The division command rode in on white spears. The inhabitants of Trine enthusiastically welcomed the Liberation Army. Delight and jubilation overflowed the hearts of all honest people. Some expressed their feelings with loud cheers, others with songs, others with shouts and cheerful shooting from the neighbouring villages continuously, on carts, trucks, on foot, arrived more and more participants of the celebration. The city experienced such a joyful evening for the first time. All electric lights were switched on. The magnifying glass took part in the celebration, rising to the zenith. It shone brightly, its silvery glow shone on people's faces, the very faces that until then expressed only anxiety. Today everyone was cheerful and cheerful, Rejoicing in the freedom they had won, happiness warmed everyone. When the entire division gathered in the square, a group of young men and women sang a patriotic song of national revival. It was immediately taken up. Solemn words and cheerful melody filled the square houses and yards. Free birds flew into the vast expanse. If anyone was sad, they forgot about it in a flash. Their hearts were beating in a fast rhythm. Their eyes were shining. Freedom is no longer a dream, but a real. The city stayed up all night. Neither did we. And how could we sleep? For the sake of this bright moment, the people had been fighting bloodily for many years. So many of their best sons and daughters had died in this name. The headquarters of the division was located in the house of Alexei Zakharayev, one of the oldest communists in the city. Here we held a brief meeting with comrades from Moscow. It was decided that Vinayarov, Dishev and Atanasov would go to Sofia, while we would stay in Troyan and wait for instructions. We also decided to call a rally the next day, at which we would speak together with Zaydravko Georgiev. The telephones were ringing all night long. Couriers were running around and all the members of the party, the ARMs and the Fatherland Front, were on their feet. The message about the rally had to be sent to the most remote Mahalas of Shipkovica, Dolga Luka and Saya Trava. Zodravko and I prepared our speeches. In them, we had to talk about everything about the difficulties that lay on our way to this day, about the prospects that lay ahead of us, about the sacrifices we had made, and about the struggle ahead of us for the consolidation of the people's democratic system. We must also speak of the broad support given by the people from the first days of the detachment's existence, and of the need for unity and cohesion in the course of building socialism. And we must also speak of the fraternal friendship with the Soviet Union, of the joint struggle shoulder to shoulder with the Yugoslav partisans, of the great help of the Soviet Union, of the importance of the Patriotic Front. And all this must be said concisely, clearly, frankly as frankly as we always spoke to the population. It was not yet dawn when boys and girls began to gather near the division headquarters. They insisted that they were enrolled in the People's Guard because the enemy has not yet been completely eliminated. The Germans are still threatening our borders. Only during these days, the division grew numerically by about a thousand people and the enrollment of volunteers continued. Around noon, the patriots released from prison, whom the Nazis and their servants had kept behind bars for many years, also arrived. Touching scenes took place in the square. Those people who had not seen each other for a long time met. Mothers and fathers asked about their sons and daughters. Children looked for their parents. It was time for the opening of the rally. 
The square was filled with people. Everyone wanted to get closer to the podium, on which will rise leading figures of the party, the Fatherland Front and the guerrilla movement. Especially our Yataks, the people who had endured the main difficulties of the struggle, over whom day and night hung the mortal danger. Here were Uncle Kolo from Bisinsi with all his family, Vasil Stoichev from Erul with his sons, Todor Stoichev from Zabel, Georgi and Nenko Mileyov from Upper Milna, Yuru Simov, Bineko from Goroshepsi, Grandfather Tosho from Lower Milna, Auntie Stana, Auntie Zaharina, Auntie Bojana, Grandma Milanka, Grandma Seta, Grandma Taka, Grandma Lina, released from prison, parents of partisans and many others who showed true courage in the days of the great national struggle. The rally was opened by Iosko Voskovarjev, chairman of the Fatherland Front Committee. He called on those present to observe a minute of silence to honor the memory of those who died in the struggle. Everyone knelt down, bowed their heads. The city falls silent. People even seem to stop breathing. A minute is too short to be able to run through all the pages of recent history, to remember dozens of dead comrades, but it is enough to feel the absence of these beautiful people who sacrificed themselves for the freedom and independence of their homeland. That is why their images are so bright and pure. That is why the memory of them will never fade. Our speeches were short. We had already said most of what we needed to say during the explanatory work on the eve of the uprising. Now it remained only to make a brief review of the way past, to call the population to high vigilance, to restore everything destroyed and looted by the fascists, to continue the fight against the enemy by other means. The enthusiasm grew continuously, like a hot flame. It flared up, spreading wide and high, and when the greetings in honor of the Soviet Union, its invincible army, the Patriotic Front, the Bulgarian Communist Party, which organized and brought our struggle to victory. In honor of the leader of the party, Georgi Dimitrov, in sounded, the joyful cheers of thousands of fighters for a new, joyful and happy life were not silenced over the square for a long time.